welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn your conference over to Karen Battle. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the 2021 National Advisory Committee Spring Virtual Meeting. Yesterday was a productive day, and today's proceedings look just as promising. Um, at 11.55 a.m., the public will have an opportunity to comment. During that time, we welcome the public to provide their public comments during the chat feature. I, as the DFO, will read the public comments during that visit. If anyone intends to give public comments today, please be mindful that comments are limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in writing for the record. If you are unable to provide your public comment today during the 20-minute public comment period, please send your public comment in writing. The Federal Register Notice located on the NAC website provides more information on submitting written comments. You will also find information regarding closed captioning services on the website. To help facilitate the discussion, members' lines will be kept open. Please keep your lines muted until acknowledged by the chair so that we can keep background noise to a minimum. Similar to yesterday, video capability is available for Census Bureau presenters and committee members. As a reminder to my Census Bureau colleagues, I encourage you to enable video during your presentation and the question and answer session. Once your topic has ended, you may turn off your video. First on today's agenda, our committee vice chair, Cherokee Bradley, will provide opening remarks. Following uh, Cherokee's remarks, James Whitehorn will present on the redistricting data program, followed by discussants Karthik Ramakrishnan, James Tucker, and committee discussion. Uh, we will then have the public comment period. Following the public comment period, Jason Devine will present on the 2020 Census data products, followed by discussant Nicole Baromio and committee discussion. Then we'll stop briefly for a 10-minute break. After the break, Jason Fields and Hyun Shin will present on the Household Poll Survey, followed by discussant John Sandoval and committee discussion. Next, Chase Sawyer will present on the Community Resilience Estimates, followed by discussants Cherokee Bradley, Interdeep Sadrath, and committee discussion. Following the committee discussion, we will have a 10-minute break. And during that time, we will suspend the meeting until 4.30 p.m. in order to allow for NAC discussion and formulation of recommendations. The WebEx platform and conference bridge will remain open during that time, but committee deliberations will be conducted offline. At 4.30 p.m., we will reconvene for the presentation of the NAC 2021 Spring Virtual Meeting Recommendations until we adjourn at 5 p.m. I would like to remind committee members to please click the raise hand icon when you are ready to speak. Once called upon by the chair, clearly state your name for the record. This is needed each time you speak for the most accurate transcript. As a reminder to the public, during the question and answer sessions occurring today, only committee members are permitted to ask questions or make comments. So please welcome NAC Vice Chair, Carol C. Bradley, who will offer opening remarks. We can't hear you, Cherokee. Cherokee. That is because I'm muted. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, yes, I want to use, uh, use this time this morning as a member who's been on board since 2019 to formally introduce myself. Um, I am Cherokee Bradley. I have been on the NAC since 2019, as I mentioned, and I'm currently a full-time MA Project Implementation Manager with Maximus Incorporated. I would like to thank James Tucker and the rest of the NAC staff for the opportunity to serve, and I look forward to working with everyone. I hail from a community um, in the, the back corners of Arkansas with a lifelong mission and professional mission of serving those with disabilities and underserved communities. 
I would like to ask the NAC, uh, current NAC members as we move forward to on today to look at your rec current recommendations and ensure that they are very concise, but also represent the communities that you serve as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cherokee. So now, uh, before we move on to the first presentation, I just want to alert uh, James Whitehorn and the discussant that, uh, again, we do need to stop at 11.55 a.m. for public comment. And so if our discussion has not concluded by that time, we'll take a break, uh, hear the public comments, and then resume the discussion. So now let's move on and let's welcome James Whitehorn, who will present on the redistricting data program, followed by discussants Karthik Ramakrishnan, James Tucker, and committee discussion. All right. Well, I thank you. Uh, thank you to the NAC for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, I, I, I look back to try to see when uh, the redistricting data program was last before the, the NAC, and I could not find uh, anything in recent, recent history. So what I really wanted to do is I want to start my remarks with a short description about the redistricting data program itself, um, because the term redistricting can bring along with it a lot of preconceptions uh, or, or other associations. But the redistricting data program in regards to the census is a pretty straightforward program. It's captured by the overall mission of the redistricting data program, which is in PO, uh, spelled out by Public Law 94171, and it essentially directs the Census Bureau to do three things. Uh, the overarching directive is that the entire process must be conducted in a nonpartisan manner. Uh, the main way we ensure the nonpartisan nature of the program each decade uh, is we reach out to the governor and the legislative leadership of both parties and all legislative chambers and ask them to select a nonpartisan liaison at the beginning of the program. This can be a single person, this can be multiple people, it can be identified by a specific position, uh, but as long as both parties within the state agree that this person or these people can represent the state in a nonpartisan manner, uh, we then accept them as the program's official liaison and we work with them for the duration of the program. We use them to communicate with the state, to exchange geographic information and any other interactions that come up uh, that are necessary for conducting the program. In addition, we also communicate extensively with the states through the nonpartisan National Conference of State Legislatures to try to make sure that we're reaching a broad audience of state legislative members and their staff. And we do one-on-one -on -one conversations with legislators and staff or presentations for committees uh, on a requested basis. The second directive of the law requires us to establish a program that allows the states to identify the small area geographic tabulations they need for conducting legislative redistricting. Now, historically, those areas identified have been voting districts and census blocks, but we also have thrown in uh, the congressional and state legislative districts, so we make sure we have a, a complement of electoral geography. And then finally, the law requires, requires us to deliver to the persons and bodies with the initial responsibility for legislative apportionment and districting those identified tabulations in those geographies they specified, as well as other geographies, no later than one year from census day. Uh, the group of recipients is composed of governors, legislative leaders, and other public bodies such as redistricting commissions. So the program's role is to design a program to achieve this work, establish the criteria, collect that small area geography, identify the required tabulations, and then deliver those tabulations. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the, the geographic collection, but I'm going to reserve the most of the comments around that delivery uh, because, as we know, that's the most current uh, information we're in. Next slide, please. So the plan for the 2020 census was established and announced through the Federal Register in July of 2014. Uh, this may seem a little early, but what many people don't realize is that the redistricting data program is required to be established no later than four years prior to Census Day. And with the nature of the work, it's typically one of the earliest programs to move into operations for the decennial census. The program is open to all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And for this decade's program, we arranged it into a series of five phases. Uh, the first two phases are the ones that occur before the census and that provide that opportunity for states to define those small geographies uh, for which they need tabulations to do their legislative redistricting work. The third phase, where we are now, is that important delivery of the data, um, which, of course, we'll talk about more later in the presentation. 
the fourth phase is the collection of the new congressional and state legislative district boundaries after states have received the data and done the work of redistricting. Uh, we actually do this collection every two years aligned with the congressional cycle uh, so that we can keep current boundaries in the census geographic universe and then we can use those uh, to provide current data for uh, all, through all of our other surveys and censuses such as the ACS. And then finally, our fifth phase is a look back and look forward where we work with the states to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the 2020 redistricting program. And then we also try to identify what's changed in the landscape around redistricting, court case rulings, things like that, uh, and, and try to determine what's going to be needed as we develop the blueprint for the 2030 program. Next slide, please. So our phase one is the Block Boundary Suggestion Project, or BBSP for short, and it was conducted in two cycles, an initial delineation cycle and a verification cycle from, the, from December of 2015 through May of 2017. Uh, I mentioned blocks being identified as critical to the redistricting uh, ever since the, uh, or they, and they have been identified that way ever since the beginning of the program in 1980. In 1980, we did not have national coverage for census blocks, but five states felt they were so important, they actually paid the Census Bureau to create statewide block coverage for those states, and states have continued to indicate that blocks are needed ever since. What this project does is it allows states to identify features that they need to be held as block boundaries uh, when those blocks are eventually created. So it's important because the census has its own needs for blocks, and we tend to use features like street center lines. Uh, as block boundaries, and this can artificially divide a neighborhood, make defining communities of interest more difficult. And so what a redistricting liaison can do is they can come in and suggest boundaries for blocks that the census wouldn't typically use, something like a rear lot line or a rear alleyway. Um, these features combined with the existing street boundaries and other features end up making a block network that allows uh, easier ways to keep neighborhoods together and to ensure communities of interest can be accurately grouped together. Next slide, please. So participation in the BBSP is completely voluntary, uh, but most states do choose to participate at some level. Uh, for the, the Block Boundary Suggestion Project this time, we had 41 states provide updates overall for just under 44% of the counties of the nation. Next slide, please. So phase two is the more visible of the two pre-census redistricting geographic exchanges that we conduct. Uh, this is where we collect the voting districts from the states, voting districts being the generic term that we, we use for wards and precincts uh, around the country. We conducted this phase with three cycles. Uh, we had an initial delineation phase, and then we had two cycles of verification. Uh, the first was to ensure that we had the first cycle of verification was to ensure we had processed what we received in that initial delineation correctly. And then the second was to provide an opportunity to review the submitted voting districts against the most current geography to ensure that relationships with other geography was being maintained while we were going through that flurry of geographic update activity that occurs right before a decennial census. Next slide, please. The VTD collections uh, are also voluntary, but we had a higher percentage participation rate. We had actually 49 states uh, out of the possible 52, because D.C. and Puerto Rico are included here uh, as state equivalents. Uh, and so we had 49 states participating, and we had 96% of the counties in the country represented. The notable exceptions here uh, with non-participation are from California, Hawaii, and Oregon. And then we also had partial participation in Maine and West Virginia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, we've already started phase three uh, with our geographic, our delivery of our geographic support materials. Uh, we did this in January and February of this year, and these materials provide the framework that states can use for conducting their redistricting. We provide the shape files, which can be used in geographic information systems, along with PDF maps uh, and other tools. Uh, the maps have county-based maps, which have every county in the country with a series of map sheets so that every single block can be identified. Uh, and then other tools that are useful uh, to folks who are processing data in sort of a database-related, non-geographic manner. States can use this data prior to receipt of the redistricting data to begin associating uh, ancillary data sets that they need for redistricting to the geography that they're going to use, and then just append that redistricting data once they receive it from the Census Bureau. 
Next slide, please. So now we find ourselves in the processing of the data so we can create the data products that we need to be able to complete this phase three delivery. Uh, Michael Thiem gave a great overview of the data processing that gets us to the redistricting data. So I'm just gonna briefly recap that work that occurs prior or from the, the point of completion of apportionment uh, through the publication of the data. So uh, we were able to begin ensuring that all the records were coded to the most detailed level of geography uh, in parallel with some of the apportionment processing. So that was, we picked up uh, some time there and we were able to begin that work. And we're actually moving in now to this conducting characteristic editing imputation, which was also touched on yesterday. Um, this is where we make sure that the uh, data set has, uh, every record has valid values. Uh, we resolve issues where there's disagreement between uh, some of the responses, such as the, the example I always use is someone who says they were born in 1971 and they're five years old. And we have the tools and techniques to be able to uh, address that. Uh, we can also address things like where someone's in a household and they say that they're married and that they're, they're 50 years old and their spouse is five years old. We have the tools and techniques to make sure that we can resolve that. And then this is also where we impute for those missing uh, responses as well. This is probably one of the most critical steps to ensuring uh, the quality of the decennial census data because the output of this, the SEP, becomes the source file for all the subsequent 2020 data products, not just the redistricting products, but the full downstream set of 2020 census data products. So this is a, a critical step in the process. After that work is done, we apply our privacy protection mechanisms. This decade, of course, we know that that'll be differential privacy, uh, but that's, we apply that to make sure that we are uh, living up to our obligations under Title 13, Section 9 to protect our respondents' data. Then we move into tabulating and reviewing all the redistricting data in multiple formats. Uh, then we create physical media, load and test our web-based systems, and then get the data out the door by September 30th. Uh, next slide, please. And so what can people expect in that September 30th delivery? We're, we're, we're terming this the, the toolkits to make the redistricting data easy to use for both the official recipients and the public. Uh, we're creating DVDs and flash drives that will take that redistricting data and it will integrate it with a, a browsing tool that has uh, intuitive browsing functions to allow people to, to readily uh, view the data, uh, isolate specific data that they want to, to examine. Uh, but we've also included some custom extraction tools to, through just a few simple clicks, you can pull out really large data sets off of these DVDs and flash drives and create sort of something like all blocks within a state for the redistricting data. And you can get that in an Excel table that you can easily then bring into a geographic information system or into a database to work with. And this is what we give to our official recipients. Uh, this will be going out to the, uh, the governors, legislative leaders in both chambers, redistricting commissions, so this is what we deliver to those, those folks. We also have our Data Explorer web tool at data.census.gov. Uh, this is the primary tool that the Census Bureau uses to disseminate data. Uh, I often use the analogy that this is like a shopping site, uh, except rather than choosing pants, you're choosing a survey and you know, you're choosing a geographic level, you're choosing a, a table from a specific survey. Uh, and then once you have all your selections made, uh, the, 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 the criteria that are the, the tables that satisfy that information uh, will be listed and you can pull them up, you can view them, you can map them, you can download them. Uh, and so that's the other tool that will be coming out in September. Next slide, please. Uh, so then uh, I wanna revisit this timeline because there, we have this important distinction that I'm sure you've heard about. So if we go back and we look at where we're saying we're tabulating, reviewing all redistricting data in multiple formats. So this is an important part. Uh, we're creating the, the data in the many formats in which it is uh, going to be uh, used throughout the Bureau and so in some cases disseminated. Uh, and in that transition from that point to the creating the physical media, loading and testing our web-based systems, as the Census Bureau was uh, examining our schedule and trying to determine a way that we could lower the impact that states are going to, or are, are faced with uh, due to their statutory redistricting requirements and their constitutional redistricting requirements and, the, and how they intersect with the delay of the delivery of this data, we recognize that there is a data set that will be available as we're going through that transition that we can provide to the public. And so I'm gonna spend a few minutes here to sort of demystify what are these legacy format summary files and try to give you some background on these. Next slide, please. So here's a couple key points about them. 
One, this product was always part of the 2020 census product plan. Uh, our goal was to deliver these files at the same time as we, we delivered those easier to use tools of the DVDs and the data.census.gov platform as a package in the same way that we did in 2010 and 2000. Uh, th those were sort of the standard. We used AFF, of course, instead of data.census.gov for 2010, but it was the same idea. These things all came out simultaneously. So this was always part of the product plan. We're just moving it up to an earlier release date. Uh, this has, as I mentioned, this has been around for a while. Uh, we've been creating it in this, this basic format since at least census 2000, uh, slightly different versions in 1980 and 1990, but still sort of in the same family of type of file. Uh, so we, we, this is something that people um, who have used this data before should still be familiar with. But the drawback here is it requires some additional handling to properly extract data from the format into tables that people are used to and from, that are familiar with and that they expect to see when they're getting their data. Um, it's fully reviewed and cleared for publication by August 16th of 2021. If someone downloaded this slide deck, I had a typo in here, which we corrected. I still had old language about uh, mid to late August in my initial slide, so we, we corrected that yesterday. Um, but this will be fully reviewed and cleared for publication by August 16th of 2021. Uh, this is the same data that we'll be releasing in the, using those toolkits in September. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is actually the source data. We'll take these summary files and we will convert them to a, a, another form that we can then merge with that browsing software to create the DVDs and flash drives. So uh, people can use this data with confidence that the data that's being released on August 16th will be the same as the data that's released on September 30th. The numbers won't change. So uh, we wanna make sure that point is also very clear. Next slide, please. Physically, uh, it's actually quite simple. Um, these are a zip file for each state. Within each zip file are four text files. And those four text files represent the entire data set for the PL94171 redistricting data for that state. Uh, it's organized as a geo header, which is one table that has all of the geographic information for every piece of geography that was calculated for the state and then the data segments, and each data segment has one or more tables of the table uh, that are part of the PL data set. So in this example, you know, table, data segment one has the race table and the Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race ta uh, tables on that data segment. Um, there's some slight changes from 2010. In 2010, the geo header was a fixed width file, the data segments were comment delimited, uh, and so this decade to try to make things easier to use. We've converted everything to just pipe delimited text files. So you're only dealing with one style of, of, of storage for this file when you're we're bringing it in to work with. We've also added into the geo header a field called geocode. This is actually uh, the unique identifier for every record's geography that associates directly with those shape files that I mentioned. So if you ex make an extraction from these files and you include that geocode field as part of that extraction, you then have the key that you need to join that up directly to the uh, shape files that Census has already provided. So that's just for an ease of use uh, type thing there. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go in a, a great bit of detail here, but I wanted to just sort of step you through the concept of how these files work together to try to demystify what these are and what we mean by additional handling. So here's an extra, uh, uh, example of two tables. I'm using the prototype uh, redistricting data that's in this, uh, this legacy format uh, that we have available on the web to create this example. So this is from Rhode Island. Uh, but you can see the top part is the geo header. It's a part of the geo header. It extends quite a bit off to the right if I included the full table. Uh, and then the bottom is data segment one. And hopefully this is large enough on your screen and you can see that uh, they both have a field in common called log recno, which stands for logical record number. This is your key field. I apologize, there's an ambulance going by. Um, this is a key field. All four of the tables have this field, and each record, uh, uh, there's an associated record between each. So if you can see in the log recno field, uh, you have unique values there, and that field is always unique values and those unique values associate with each other between tables. So you make a linkage between these two uh, fields. Next slide, please. 
And with that linkage intact, you can ask questions of this data set. You have to query the database. Uh, so I'm putting a simple question of, I want total population for the townships in Rhode Island. So of course, I do have to go to the technical documentation and I have to uh, know that summary levels is how census defines the geographies that are stored in this table and that the summary level code for a township or a minor civil division as it's called in census language is 060. I also know that the first field in the P1 table, uh, which is P0010001, is total population. I can also get that from the technical documentation. Uh, next slide, please. So then I construct a query where I say, give me all the records where summary level equals 060, so I'm getting my townships, and, you, uh, and then I want for my output, I want to have that geocode field because that's important uh, for joining to my shape file. I want the name, which of course isn't in the table, it's one of the fields that's off to the, to the right that I told you I truncated, uh, but I want the name uh, so I can have an English version description of those townships. And I want the P001 table. So it, it selects all the records where there's the summary level 060. It pulls those uh, equivalents from the geocode and the name field, but then it uses that linkage to reach over into the other file and find the records that match those records. And then next slide, please. So then when you get an output, you get a nice table more what you expect to see from the census typically, where you just have the records that are for the townships, you have the geocodes, so you can link them in geography, you know what their names are, and you have their total population. So hopefully that sort of breaks out some of the uh, mystery of, of this file format. Next slide, please. We are trying uh, to do as much support as we can to help support this, this file once it's re eventually released. Uh, we have had consultations with the major software vendors. We've talked to Caliper Corporations, who, ma who makes Maptitude. We've talked to CityGate GIS. We've talked to ESRI. We've talked to Election Data Services. We've talked to Poli Data. Um, we've talked to the National Conference of State Legislators, uh, the staff that, that manages the Redistricting and Elections Committee. Uh, and we've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with states, all to make sure that everyone feels they understand this data format and they feel they can work with this data format. And I would say uh, to the, to the um, single member, we have, we have had fully positive feedback that everyone we've talked to so far feels that they will be able to and will likely use this format of the data. We've already posted the technical documentation. So as I mentioned, you, know, you kind of have to refer to the technical documentation to be able to create those queries. That, that, that product is already available. We have a prototype data set that we created from our 2018 end-to-end -end census test in Providence County, Rhode Island. This is uh, only for Providence County data, but it's in the format of these 2020 census legacy format summary files. And there's a link in the, the decks uh, so people can find that easily on our website. Uh, those text files that I, I mentioned that come in that zip file, they're just the, the, the records. They don't have any headers. They don't have field names contained within. So we've created an Excel format file that has different worksheets, that has those headers, so if someone wants to pull that into whatever software they're going to use out of that Excel file, they'll have all those field headers in the proper order, in the proper spelling. Uh, and then we also included tabs that show the plain English definitions of what those header shorthand uh, field names mean. We've created a Microsoft Access database shell. This is a database shell which has empty tables that you can use with the prototype data or you can use with the 2020 data when it becomes available. Uh, it will work with both. Uh, we've also inserted into those access database shells example queries to demonstrate how the query logic works uh, and to provide a way for people to practice if they want to practice with the Providence Rhode Island data. Uh, and we have, in short order, they're not up there yet. They're actually still going through our quality control. They've been written, but they're, we're having uh, a different group of people review the, the scripts to make sure that uh, they, they pass the full quality control process. Uh, we'll have SAS scripts. So those of you who work in statistical software, we'll be able to run these SAS scripts to be able to import this data and begin your work as well. Next slide, please. So I, I was asked to put some questions in for NAC, um, and they're not necessarily directly related to the materials I presented to you just now, um, 
But, you know, the, the, the Census Bureau, as I mentioned, has Phase 5, which is our analysis uh, where we look back at how we did for the 2020 program, but it's also our look forward for the 20, uh, for the 2020, it's our look forward for the 2030 program. Uh, and it actually comes out as a report where we lay out the principles that will guide the construction of the 2030 program. Um, so <clears throat> that'll start actually maybe even before we get the data out so we can capture some of the things that have happened quite a bit ago. Um, but we wanted to pose to the NAC a few questions. Are there changes you would like for us to consider integrating into the planning for the 2030 redistricting data products? Um, also, uh, currently, the, uh, the data product for the, the, the redistricting data uses the full 63 possible permutations of race within them. So you, if someone answered uh, that they were a member of all six races, they would be reported in that way, and there's a special category there. So it ends up being 63 permutations. Uh, a couple more for the table that includes Hispanic, because we take all the Hispanic respondents who are of that ethnicity, uh, and then we iterate the non-Hispanic. But if the, those questions were to be combined um, into a single question, and then possibly a, a, another category was added, so we added MENA as either an ethnicity or a race, how would you want to see all of the permutations? Because that then starts to get to be a very large table or is it uh, acceptable to try to, to uh, summarize the table and, and show sort of uh, uh, stop at a certain level in that table where we don't break out those permutations? Um, also, how important is block level data uh, from the redistricting data set to the work you do, redistricting or otherwise? Uh, we hear frequently that it's critical for redistricting, but we don't know if other folks have, who we work with the data have a, a consistent need uh, either programmatic, uh, statutory, or otherwise, for use of that block-level data. Uh, and so the idea is, could your work still be accomplished if we moved away from block-level data for the future? And next slide, if there is one. Ah, and so with that, I would uh, turn this back over to uh, Dr. Karthik and Dr. Tucker, and thank you very much for, for the listening. Thanks so much, James. Um, next slide, please. So we, we want to start off by recognizing something that we, we've been talking a lot about data, but one of the interesting things here is that we're seeing the marriage of data and geography. And this, um, we, we want to particularly applaud the Bureau for its work on the Voting District Project. Um, I, I thought it would be helpful just to explain why it is that it's so important. Um, in the past, it, it was normal. In fact, it was, it was the, the normal course of business that census block geography did not match up with political geography like voting districts and precincts. And the reason why that mattered is because when you were going through and doing redistricting or if you were engaged in voting rights enforcement, you would end up having to inject into it um, another layer of expert testimony to basically provide estimates for split census blocks so that you could have that marriage between the political data that you were analyzing and the demographic characteristics of the split census block. And what that ended up doing is it ultimately ended up resulting in some, you know, less accuracy and uh, more confusion in the redistricting process, and it also complicated uh, the racially polarized voting analysis that we would have to do. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, we wanted to just touch on was some of the questions and, and uh, issues that we have. I think as a, as a starting point, um, I think it's amazing that so many states have opted into it and that we're actually going to see that the norm now is that the um, census geography and the census blocks match up with voting precincts um, because that really will help considerably both with um, state and local governments as they go through and redistrict uh, as well as the Department of Justice and um, uh, civil rights organizations in terms of voting rights enforcement. What we would like to find out, though, is why is it that there are still some holdouts in states that have not participated in the Voting District Project, and what are the reasons that they've given, and in what ways, if, if any, can we address those so that we can really get 100 percent participation looking forward to 2030? Um, and then in the event that we actually do achieve that 100 percent, um, participation. Is it just a matter of, of communicating better incentives? Is there, is, is there a way that um, it seems they would be pretty clear to the states now that um, certainly the, the incentives and the motivations for participating in the project are substantial, 
Um, and then I guess the other part of this is always when you're talking about governments is whether or not it's a resource issue um, and also whether or not we should actually try to push the voting district project a little bit earlier into the 2030 preparation cycle. Um, and then I guess as part of all of this, we're, we're obviously much of what we're talking about the, the uh, yesterday and today is ultimately going to boil down to evaluations of the 2020 census. And we would like to know if the Bureau is intending to conduct an evaluation of the voting district project as part of the 2020 census review. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karthik for the next slide, please. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I'll take the next uh, few slides. So with respect to uh, release of the geographic support products, uh, we applaud uh, Zero as from all that we've heard, it's been relatively smooth, uh, excellent communication by the Bureau, but the release schedule for each set of state products, um, the supporting technical documentation for the shape files were easy to understand. We appreciate the inclusion of the block-to-block -block relationship files, which facilitate a comparison between the 2010 and 2020 census block level geography. Um, as indicated, we have not heard of any concerns about this first set of 2020 census data products. Next slide. Now, there have been some confusion about uh, the legacy format. Um, so we applaud the Bureau for its planned release of the legacy format summary files, uh, but some data users have expressed confusion about whether the legacy files include the same data as the official uh, PL94-171 release in late September. Uh, this presentation is, uh, is, has been helpful, um, and you know, being able to communicate that um, more clearly to the uh, to to various users um, would be um, would be good. Uh, so we understand that the legacy files include the PL 94171 data, but are not in in the same kind of user friendly format that will be released in September. The format will not be an issue for data users using GIS mapping software in which the data already has been formatted for use by the general public. Much of the confusion appears to be the result of messaging and the reference to the files as legacy data as opposed to legacy format. There's also concern that the legacy files may be delayed, uh, and therefore there must be utmost priority to ensure that the files are indeed delivered by August 16th, uh, if not earlier. Next slide. Um, so some of the questions uh, that we have are to ask, in what ways have the legacy format summary files been improved from previous releases of the PL94-171 redistricting data? In addition, can the Census Bureau improve and more widely disseminate messaging that the legacy files include the same data as the official 94 release anticipated in late September, taking into account that reference to legacy has added to some of the confusion. And finally, is it possible to create a video with technical guidance to walk data users through the legacy files and how to format those for general use? I think, is it back to you now, Jim? I believe so. Yes, um, so next slide, please. So th the other piece of this, of course, is that this is going to be the first data product that we're going to see that will have the differential privacy that in the new disclosure avoidance system applied to it. And um, this raises a number of questions, and these are questions that I know that not only we have voiced, but um, I'm sure the, the Census Bureau has been hearing a chorus of, of these questions coming from the community and especially the state and local governments that, um, that are concerned both about the quality of the data um, and the time frame within which they're going to get it. And so the first question that's raised by this is what is the absolute deadline that the Bureau has for making its final decision on um, both the differential privacy, the algorithm, the privacy loss budget in order to meet its September 30th um, deadline date? As we understand it um, with, with um, DCEP meeting in early June, it seems like we're on a very, very tight time frame, but it would be interesting to find out what is the drop dead date for that? Um, the other part of this is uh, obviously there's been a balance between um, accuracy and privacy, but, um, and I understand that you've been getting a lot of input, the Bureau's been getting a lot of input from uh, the public and data users and stakeholders about accuracy. 
but it also raises the question of what does the Bureau uh, believe to be data that's accurate enough to meet the priority use for redistricting? And then the other piece of this, and I understand from the, the comment that was made yesterday that the Bureau obviously cannot comment specifically about litigation, but what we really are interested in is, again, going back to the drop dead deadline, what happens if the Bureau ends up getting a, a court order, a federal court order, that says you cannot apply differential privacy to the PL data, and how would that actually impact the September 30th, 2021 release date? Um, how much additional time would it add? Presumably it would add some time. How much time would it add to the data processing if the Bureau has to go to an alternative form of disclosure avoidance? Um, next slide, please. And so just again, going back, circling back to the differential privacy and its application to the data set, um, we, we also are interested in, because I think this is another part, is uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the impact of differential privacy and the concerns about the accuracy of census block level redistricting data. But I think the other thing that we have to consider is what, what would the impact be of using some alternative to it? Uh, presumably it could either be um, suppression or swapping, the problem we obviously get into with suppression is that when you're engaged in redistricting and you have to meet one person, one vote requirements, you have to, um, obviously you need to know race and ethnicity and population data, um, voting age population to be able to draw districts. Um, suppression doesn't really seem like a viable alternative. And if that leaves us with, um, with swapping, what does that end up looking like? Is it actually going to place potentially um, jurisdictions and even civil rights organizations in a worse position. Um, I, I certainly don't want to say that any of us know what the answer to that is, but it's certainly something that we have to consider um, given the fact that redistricting will have to occur and we, we need to consider what the impact of the alternatives would be. Um, next slide, please. And it's back to you, Karthik. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, so finally, with respect to uh, the release of redistricting data by September 30th, 2021. A uh, couple of final questions. One, do you foresee any possibility of being able to release the redistricting data any earlier? Uh, so, for example, are we talking about a resource constraint or some other kind of logistical constraint uh, where the provision of additional resources may not uh, expedite the availability uh, of redistricting data before September 30th? Uh, and then finally, in addition to the availability of third-party tools, uh, various software uh, to help communities work with the redistricting data to identify communities of interest, how has the Census Bureau improved the user interface and user experience of its own data and mapping tools with respect to redistricting data? Uh, and with that, we'll go to the next slide and open it up for discussion. And just and looking Jim, at the list. Maybe you can handle the uh, chat if that's okay. Oh, sure. No, absolutely. So it looks like the um, the first person who's asked a question is Rosemary Rodriguez. Um, you had placed a question in the chat. So if you would like to ask your question, that would be great. Um, and just to remind others, please feel free to either raise your hand or put your question in the chat and we'll get you in the queue. I'm just wondering about the source. Rosemary Rodriguez, Denver, Colorado. Wondering about the source of the uh, ward or precinct data, does that come from the state level or from the county? Thank you. Uh, certainly. So um, that's actually a more complicated question to answer than it originally sounds. Uh, we are obligated to work with the states and to work with those nonpartisan liaisons that I uh, mentioned in order to collect that precinct and ward data. Uh, but we do also recognize that um, the precincts and wards typically are, are designed and maintained at the county level. So we've done a couple of things. One, several states have their own method for this. Some, some have a, a county state interaction, uh, even on a regular basis in the off years to maintain those, that, that geographic uh, level. But we've also done things like uh, the partnership software that we provided to the states to be able to use for, uh, for, for providing us those voting districts we made it work in such a way that they could give it to their counties, the counties could do the work, and they could send it to the state, and the state could then look at it and review it and then submit it to us with their official stamp on it. We also uh, 
have a provision where the official liaisons can deputize people in the, the counties to submit to us directly if that's the way they want to do it. And so different states have different ways of handling this, um, but we do try to encourage the state to work with the counties to make sure that we're getting the, the, the best VTDs that we can. Yeah, I don't see any other questions in the chat um, or, or hands up, but please, if you, if you have any questions, and while I'm waiting for someone else to pose a question, I will pose one of my own. And I'm just curious, um, James, again, we want to thank you so much for all the work that you and your office have been doing, especially um, given, you know, given the changing schedule and, and all the challenges that all of you have faced. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious whether or not you've gone back uh, kind of retrospectively at the end of a decennial census and, um, you know, basically done a, a quality review just to, just to see, um, to survey, you know, data users and stakeholders on um, their experiences with the data products and the geography uh, and then how you've used that information as you've gone forward to, to both update the geography um, and update your plans for releasing future data. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we have done that in regard to, especially with those nonpartisan liaisons and then the, the technical uh, people that they deputize either out in the counties or in the states. Um, we, we do tend to have uh, working sessions with them to uh, capture their experience with the data. We also, um, sort of in an unofficial way, we have a lot of interaction as soon as the data is released if they notice anything in the data. Um, and I can definitely say that for this decade, uh, they feel that the data is much improved over uh, what we provided last decade. So uh, we're very pleased with that. Um, there tends to be uh, sometimes some issues that, that don't get uncovered until that data is released. Um, we have one state where they recognize that they were submitting data for their places from one source and their, their precincts from another, and so they don't quite line up. Um, but what that does is we capture that and we use that in our planning for the next decade for things to look out for, suggestions that we can provide in the instructions, things we can look for in our QA uh, process uh, when we receive files. Um, so we, we, do, we do go through sort of an extensive review of how we did the collection, uh, what the uh, customer, the, the states that have to use this data, um, what they feel uh, or how well they feel that data turned out, uh, and then try to look for anything that we can do to, um, you know, keep pushing the envelope to make it better each decade. Okay, I don't see any um, anyone else in the queue in terms of NAC members, but um, I just I want to thank you, James, so much for all the work that you do that you're doing. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Obviously, it's really really vital to the work that a lot of stakeholders um, are doing. Uh, I, actually, I will take that back. It looks like uh, we have a question from Interdeep, but I, I do want to thank you again for all the work, um, especially under the uh, under the modified schedule. And with that, I'm going to call on Interdeep to make her comment. You're on mute, Interdeep. Thing. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So thanks, James. Uh, for a very useful presentation. So you mentioned that there were 63 possible race permutations um, that that these uh, data files contain. So the, the question is that is there a way to integrate in those into categories such that it, recon it reconciles with other sources and, you know, allows for some useful analysis uh, for communities and for the other compliance work that we do? Um, because obviously 63 categories are not workable. Um, so that's, that's a discussion that uh, it intersects with um, what we've done historically uh, and what we're trying to look for. Um, as you've heard during the differential privacy discussion yesterday, um, the fact that we provide all this data to such granularity at the block level does create um, a, 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 it's a, it requires a lot of privacy loss budget to be able to still make it uh, accurate. And so, um, we are looking to see if there are things we can do that can uh, summarize some of those categories. Maybe we only report down to four or more races. This is just an example, uh, but to four or more races, and then we leave uh, leave anyone who said that they were four or more races in that group without identifying what races they said they were. 
There's pluses and minuses to that. It would reduce the complexity of the file, make it easier for people to work with. Uh, but then there's also minuses in the sense that you can no longer create the race alone or uh, in combination category because you don't have those additional uh, people. And, and as we become a, a, uh, a more multiracial society, those numbers over the course of several decades could become larger and larger, and so you'd be missing more and more of the population that you'd want to be measuring. So it's really, um, I don't have any good suggestions around it. It's a discussion that I think we want to have as we move into the 2030 planning. Thank you. Thanks so much. And um, with that, Karen, I'm going to turn it back over to you and just to let you know, I'm going to be rebooting my computer. I'm, I'm having some video issues, um, but during the public comment period, I should be back on by the time we're done with public. Actually, Jim, th this is Karthik. I'm wondering if I, I can just ask maybe just to the question about on this question about the 63 permutations. Um, my only suggestion may be that it can be offered in both formats in a kind of simpler format as well as a more complex format if the size of these data files is a concern. Uh, perhaps there's a way to offer both options. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Okay, with that, Karen, I'll turn it back over to you and I will be logging back in in just a moment. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so we actually have a couple of minutes before the public comment uh, session is supposed to start. Um, so Shauna, I'll just confirm that we need to wait until 11.55 to begin that. Karen, this is Shauna Banks. You can begin with the public comments we've received in advance, and we will continue to hold the, couple of the comment period in chat until the 20 minutes has expired. So you may begin with public comment. Okay, thank you very much, Shauna. All right, so it is now time for public comment. Uh, during this virtual meeting, we take public comments via the chat feature. Comments are limited to two minutes. Uh, anything over that may be submitted in writing for the record. When submitting your comment via chat, please include your name and affiliation with your comment. So I will begin with the comments that we received uh, prior to starting this morning. The first comment comes from Joanne Farah. Thank you for allowing me to help out with the post enumeration survey. In reading the notes of all 42 cases prior to go date, I quickly noticed a trend of frustrated households. After talking about this trend with my current supervisors, I was encouraged and ready for the challenge of successfully completing my cases. Now that I've had the opportunity to visit numerous households and meet lots of fantastic people, I need to bring something to your attention. The respondents have asked me to make sure the Census Bureau knows of their experiences. These households are frustrated. They feel badgered and bullied. They've been pestered by ringing doorbells and endless notes left at their doors. They've been visited by as many as eight different Census Bureau employees, mostly enumerators and mostly in the summer, fall of 2020. After completing the 2020 Census online, they completed it two to four more times with an enumerator at their door. Oftentimes, they've completed the questions within a week of the time before. I'm hearing similar stories from the majority of homes I visited. Many have mentioned that they feel targeted and have felt harassed by the Census Bureau. One respondent told me her husband purchased a ring doorbell because of the census workers coming to the door. I understand the Census Bureau experienced some unique challenges with the introduction of the online option and training supervising the enumerators during the pandemic, but we need to do better. We need to leave the public feeling good about participating in the census we need them to want to participate again in 2030. Additionally, the Census Bureau needs the public to open their doors and help complete the 120 plus surveys that I and many other field reps work on every day. As a permanent part-time employee of the Census Bureau, I have felt a strong responsibility to show professionalism and to leave each respondent feeling positive about the Census Bureau and the decennial census. Okay. The next comment, comes from Herb Seaman. Will anyone be addressing the longer surveys being done and the redundancy of questions 
adding to the time of the interview that respondents really don't like. Has anyone who writes these interviews actually ever given an interview and had to deal with respondent frustration over repeated questions and an interviewer um, when the interview goes over an hour? There is also the issue of interview fatigue, where people are tired of talking to field representatives and do everything to avoid us. This just leaves the FRs hounding people so an SSFA can get a high percent of interviews, but it gets annoying to them and us. The next comment comes from Deborah Stein with the Partnership for America's Children. I write today to submit the partnership comments for the May 2021 MAC meeting. The partnership recommends the appointment of a senior staff member at the Census Bureau to oversee efforts to ensure an accurate count of young children for the decennial census, all demographic surveys, administrative records, population estimates, and other data activities, including participating from the beginning in the preparation for the 2030 census. Evaluating the Census Bureau's efforts to count young children in the 2020 census, using administrative records only to supplement, not replace, direct efforts in counting young children, and ensuring that the use of administrative records addresses certain situations where young children are at risk of being missed. Making the post enumeration survey effective for assessing the accuracy of the count of young children. Improving the quality of information from the Census Household Pulse Survey with respect to young children, and making sure that research on improving the ACS includes measures specifically focused on improving the count of young children. The Bureau needs to identify a central point of contact and responsibility for data on children. There should be a subject matter expert focused on data products about young children. In addition, someone should be coordinating research and evaluation work on the undercount of young children across directorates. Therefore, the Census Bureau should incorporate into all its work a mechanism for improving the count of young children. By 2018, the operational plan indicated very little focus on young children and proposed wording changes that had not been tested with targeted households. The extent to which the undercount of young children was overlooked is reflected in the fact that none of the over 40 focus groups in the CBAM study were specifically for parents with young children, and the questions did not address whether families would count their young children and what would encourage them to count them. The next comment comes from Olivia Gomez with First Focus on Children. We ask that the U.S. Census Bureau balance the need to protect families' privacy with ensuring that federal, state, and local officials have sufficient data to make critical decisions about allocation of funding for resources such as education and health care that support children's healthy development. Many decisions about allocation of funding for children are made at the local level, such as public education funding, and so we urge that data is made available by both state and local legislative districts and contains enough detail to provide a holistic picture of child well-being at the local level. Child poverty levels and other indicators of child well-being differ greatly by zip code and neighborhood across cities, towns, and large urban areas. And so the decennial census is critical in providing comparable state and local data that is precise enough to help local decision makers understand how to best target resources critical to help all children thrive. This includes data on the relationship of the child to the householder so that policymakers and advocates can understand the nature of the complex families in their communities and meet their needs. We also need data that is broken out by race and ethnicity at local levels, smaller than place, so that policymakers and child advocates and communities can understand where racial and ethnic populations are within cities and towns and make sure that all communities have equitable access to voting stations and public services. We urge the U.S. Census Bureau to provide the specific data from the 2020 Census necessary to inform responsible decision-making about child well-being, while also protecting the privacy of households with children. The next comment uh, that we received came from uh, Didis Katagi who is the director of the California Complete Count Census Office. 
California's final campaign report are uh, provided in uh, the information that was submitted to the census and can be found on the website census.ca.gov. The state of California invested $187.2 million in outreach and communications for Census 2020, another nearly $26 million in private foundations and $20 million in local government funding was also spent on the ground across the state to encourage self-response. We are pleased that California's self-response rate of 69.6% exceeded both the national rate and California's 2010 rate. Our efforts were successful in getting nearly 10.5 million households to self-respond, and that included 2.5 million households in our hardest to count census tract. California outperformed other large states in activating those who were least likely to respond. 45 of the 58 counties and 344 of 482 cities met or exceeded their 2010 final response rate. Okay, so now I will go through the chat. And hey, Madam, this is Shauna Banks. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, you do not need to read the Deborah Stein chat. So you may move to the Deborah Weinstein chat. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's see if we have any other chats to read. I think we've covered them, Shauna. Is there anything else in the chat? We have a chat at 11.56 a.m. Okay. Okay, I see a comment here from Deborah Weinstein. Uh, comments, questions for the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations, uh, submitted by Deborah Weinstein, the Executive Director, Coalition on Human Needs. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the Household Pulse Survey and the need for an ongoing focus at the Census Bureau on improving the accuracy of the count of children, especially the youngest children. I want to emphasize how vitally important the Household Pulse Survey survey has been for the hundreds of thousands reached by the Coalition on Human Needs. We include organizations concerned with poverty, work supports, including childcare, food and housing security, healthcare, and education. We use household post survey data regularly in a biweekly publication. Um, we do uh, called COVID-19 Watch, Tracking Hardships. We have also helped state advocates to make use of the state data. We strongly recommend that the household poll survey is continued indefinitely, since we know that households with low, and then the comment, I believe, has been cut off. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat, Shauna. Further down at 12.01, the remainder of Ms. Weinstein's comments. Oh, to cut them off, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. So at this time, I do not see any further public comments. So, Shauna, are we able to, I guess we are to resume the meeting or go on to the next session or what should well, we? Let's hold for just a moment while we get in place. Thank you. Okay.
and, and while we're waiting, um, I, this is James. Um, I just wanted to mention that I, I'm back in WebEx, but I think I need to be re-added as a panelist. Um, I, I'm just connected via audio right now, not video. Thank you for that, James. I'm sure the advisory staff will work on that for you. Yes, we are. Here you can hand it over to Jason Devine. Okay, so we're able to get started a little early. And um, all right, so I see Jason's video, and I believe he is ready. So let us move on to our next session. Uh, Jason Devine is here with us today, and he will update all of you on the 2020 Census data products. So, Jason, uh, take it away. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Devine. I work in the Population Division, and I am pleased to be able to provide an update on the 2020 Census data products today. I will start with some background to let you know where we are. I will then discuss the 2020 Census data products and how they are split into categories based on the approach for disclosure avoidance. I'll then talk about recent developments and the work ahead. Um, subject matter experts are also on the phone to help me with questions. So next slide, please. I'm going to start by providing some background information to let you know where we are. The schedule for the reuse products beyond the redistricting data has not been determined, but we will discuss some of the draft plans during our presentation today. The 2020 Census data product schedule is dependent on the timing of the release of the apportionment and Public Law 94-171 redistricting data. The review of the 2020 Census production files and changes made to post-processing impacted the schedule for the release of the apportionment and redistricting products. And as you probably know, the apportionment release occurred last week on April 26th, and also earlier this morning, James Whitehorn provided a detailed update on the plans for the 2020 Census redistricting data product, starting with the release of the PL legacy format files. So the schedule for products beyond the redistricting data will include time for stakeholder feedback on the disclosure avoidance system that will be used for those products. Next, next slide, please. 2020 census data products, with the exception of the apportionment products, have been divided into three categories based on the disclosure avoidance approach that will be used. All approaches that will use disclosure avoidance methods that are based on differential privacy. That is, the approach will vary across these sets of products, but each approach will, will use differential privacy. The first group of products includes the redistricting file, PL94171, uh, that comes out on first, and, and then we'll, we will release the demographic profile, and then we will release the demographic and housing characteristics product, or the DHC. And James discussed the redistricting file during the last presentation. The demographic profile uh, will provide critical demographic and housing characteristics about local communities from selected DHC tables in a streamlined, easy-to-use format to the release of the redistricting product as possible. The demographic profile will be available at the place of minor civil division level and geographies above that level. The demographic and housing characteristics product, the DHC, will include many of the demographic and housing tables previously included in summary file one. Data in the DHC will be available for different levels of geography. The data will be available for all geographies at and above the lowest level they're released for. In many cases, this will be at the census block level. Next slide, please. The second category includes the detailed demographic and housing characteristics product, or the detailed DHC as we've been referring to it. The detailed DHC will include tables that were included in summary file two and some of the tables included in summary file one from 2010 that were not included in the DHC because of the challenges they pose for disclosure avoidance. This includes detailed race and Hispanic origin tables and tables for the American Indian Alaska Native summary file. The detailed DHC will also include complex person household join tables that were not included in the DHC. 
Again, all approaches we use disclosure avoidance methods that are based on differential privacy. That is, the approaches might vary across these three sets of products, but each approach will use differential privacy. Next slide, please. And after that, a third group of 2020 census data products is planned that may include a public use micro data sample file or a PUMS file. That will include the Congressional District Demographic and Housing Characteristics product and special tabulations. Again, all approaches, all three of these categories will use disclosure avoidance methods that are based on differential privacy. So we're focused on the system that will protect the PL product right now. Uh, and the privacy protected micro files or the PPMFs and detailed accuracy metrics that were just released are for the disclosure avoidance system that will support the PL product. These are demonstration products that allow the public to see the results of the disclosure avoidance system. And those of you who are not familiar, the PPMF is a file that includes 2010 microdata that has been protected using the disclosure avoidance system. And the detailed accuracy metrics are accuracy metrics that show the differences between these tabulated micro-level records in the 2010 census published tables. So this system will be expanded to protect the file that will support the demographic profile and the um, demographic and housing characteristics file. Uh, work on, on the system that's going to protect the detailed DHC is also going on, but in parallel. Next slide, please. Now I'll go into uh, more detail about the redistricting file, the demographic profile, and the uh, DHC, and what each product, product will include. As I mentioned, the next data product we will release will be the redistricting file. I'll go through this quickly since James covered it this morning, but I wanted to include it since these slides will be online and maybe used as a resource by others. The redistricting file will be the first file released that will include demographic and housing characteristics for detailed geographic areas and the data identified by states as required for redistricting under Public Law 94-171 includes data on the voting age population, race, Hispanic origin, occupancy status, and the group quarters population for the seven major GT types. These data will be available at the census block level, and the data will also be available for geographies above the lowest level they're released for. For example, these tables will be available at the block level, but there will also be tables from levels above the block level. Next slide, please. Demographic profile will follow the redistricting data and will provide critical demographic and housing characteristics about local communities from selected DHC tables in a streamlined, easy-to-use format as soon after the release of the redistricting product as possible. The subjects for the demographic profiles will include five-year age groups, sex, race, Hispanic or Latino origin, household type, relationship to householder, the group quarters population, housing occupancy, and housing tenure. They will be available at the place and minor civil division level, and uh, as I mentioned previously, at levels above that level. Next slide, please. So after the demographic profile, the DHC will be released. The DHD will include many of the demographic and housing tables previously included in Summary File 1. Subjects will include age, sex, race, Hispanic or Latino origin, household type, family type, relationship to householder, and sub some subjects will be, provided, uh, will be provided for major OMB race and ethnicity groups. Uh, tables on the group quarters population, house, housing occupancy, and housing tenure. Data in the DHC will be available for many different levels of geography, and in many cases, this will be at the census block level. And again, the data will be available for all the geographies above the lowest level they are released for. So for example, if a table is available at the block level, there will also be tables for the levels above the block level. Because of the challenges some tables presented for disclosure avoidance, the DHC will not include tables that provide counts by detailed race, detailed Hispanic origin, tribes, and population counts by household family types, which are uh, will be part of the complex person household join tables I mentioned in a previous slide. These tables will be included in the detailed DHC. Next slide, please. In 2019, we provided an extensive presentation during the fall NAC meeting 
The presentation along with other materials are available online and I've provided links for you on this slide. Some of these materials, such as a crosswalk file that provided details about what was included in the DHC and how it related to the 2010 products, will be updated as we go forward. I've also included a link to our Disclosure Avoidance website. Here you will find everything from how to understand differential privacy to links to the demonstration products that we've already made available. Next slide, please. Now I'll go into some of the more recent developments. So we have been busy. Substantial progress has been made on the development of the disclosure avoidance system that will support the redistricting product. We resumed the differential privacy working group and extended its duration until December of 2022. It was initially set to expire in July. And a special meeting will be held this spring to obtain NAP recommendations on differential privacy. Multiple privacy protected microdata files, PPMFs, and detailed summary metrics for the redistricting product have been released for public review and comment most recently um, last week. And the sharing of the PPMFs and detailed summary metrics was in response to external feedback and requests to be able to um, have a, both a micro level file that would allow them to do their own analysis of differences between the protected data and the 2010 data and uh, summary metrics that we developed for them. Uh, the privacy loss budget used for the PPMFs that were released last week was increased and reallocated to improve accuracy for a specific set of redistricting and voting rights act metrics. And we are requesting feedback on the new PPMFs by May 28, 2021, with the DCEP decision on the final PLB expected in early June. Next slide, please. As I alluded to earlier, the development of the disclosure avoidance system for the first set of products was split into two stages, a stage for the redistricting product and a stage for the demographic profile and the demographic and housing characteristics file. Additional race by Hispanic origin iterations have been included for the DHD tables. And we are developing, currently developing the timeline and plans for work on the DC, DHC disclosure avoidance system. We've determined the name and scope of the 2020 detailed DHC. And progress is being made on disclosure, the disclosure avoidance system to support the detailed DHC um, products. And this is going on in parallel with the work on the other systems. And out, outreach with stakeholders and advisory groups has continued and helped informed decisions along the way. Next slide, please. We are in the process of planning for the disclosure avoidance work, disclosure avoidance work on the demographic and housing characteristics file or the DHC. Experts from the Census Bureau's Population Division and the Social, Economic, and Housing Statistics Division will be refining accuracy targets for the DHC disclosure avoidance system. Privacy protected microdata files, or PPMFs again, will be released to allow the public to assess the accuracy and privacy protection of the DHC tables using 2010 census data. We do need to, to determine the timeline for the DHC PPMF review and how many PPMFs will be released. And the DHC PPMFs release will, uh, and feedback loop will follow a similar cadence to our engagement with the PPMFs for the redistricting product. And decisions about the number of PPMFs released will be informed by the results of the assessments of the initial files that will be released. Next slide, please. I'll conclude with some questions for NAC. First question is, do you have suggestions on developing accuracy targets for the demographic and housing characteristics tables? Second question is, do you have suggestions for the amount of time needed for the public to provide feedback on the DHC PPMS? And are there external researchers you would recommend census reach out to for feedback? We've been able to provide early access to the PPMS for some external researchers by establishing special sworn status and providing files to them shortly before they're released to the public in the FSRDC environment. And finally, 
what questions or concerns you have about the DHC or other 2020 census data products. Thank you. And I will now uh, turn it over to the uh, discussant. Thank you. What about now? Am I coming through now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Nicole Borromeo here coming to you from Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and I'm going to be providing the discussant presentation this morning. Can we go to the next slide, please? The U.S. Census Bureau should be commended for attempting to modernize its disclosure avoidance system through differential privacy. This is part of its mandate to collect data. By way of background, the Bureau used data um, swapping as its primary method for the 2010 census to comply with the 72-year rule. If you don't know what that is because you're new to the NAS, um, that is a Title 13 requirement that any data collected has to remain private and confidential for 72 years. Um, this method involves swapping existing characteristic data, um, such as race, ethnicity, et cetera, between residents at the block level. Um, but the Bureau became concerned that advances in technology would no longer remedy um, any data breaches in privacy, so that is why the Bureau moved to modernizing the method through differential privacy. For 2020, for the first time, we have a new method, which involves adding characteristic data um, through statistical noise. Um, by now, everyone knows that that is um, a mathematical formula, hopefully you know that at the block level through differential privacy, but substantial questions remain about whether or not the resulting data is going to be fit for legal uses, um, primarily redistricting. Next slide, please. Um, James has mentioned that the Bureau has made substantial progress in the development of differential privacy to support the 2020 data. Um, a couple of questions here is, um, is it normal to be in the developmental stage at this point in census operations? And um, I'll go to the next bullet and um, question and then we'll turn it over to um, James and he can answer. Um, because preliminary reports from civil rights organizations such as MALDEF have found a disparate impact of applying differential privacy to small communities or small counties. So what is the impact of differential privacy on smaller subsects of communities and counties? Jim, did, did you want to have the census answer right now or just me continue to go through the slides? No, um, go ahead and go through your presentation and then we can um, perhaps have Jason answer some of the questions and then we'll open it up for the, dis uh, the discussant questions. Okay. Sorry, thanks. Next slide then, please. Um, data products from the 2020 census have to meet certain legal standards as I was just referring to, such as redistricting. This requires equal population between the districts and VRA compliance as well as the Voting Rights Act. Applying redistricting, um, excuse me, differential privacy to the redistricting file though could make um, proposed electoral districts appear properly populated when in fact they are malapportioned and therefore unlawful. So some questions here are how does differential privacy affect statewide and local total plan deviation? Would deviation changes be so high as to become malapportioned at a later time? And how will differential privacy impact the ability to draw districts that afford minority voters an equal protection or excuse me, equal opportunity to elect their candidates of choice? Next slide, please. This is a um, slide just for the demographic profile, um, and it's an example that I, I care deeply about um, being Alaska Native and working for the Alaska Federation of Natives, because the United States owes a special trust relationship to federally recognized tribes and individual Indian beneficiaries. This commands the highest moral and legal obligations. The responsibility is rooted in federal tribal treaties and the United States Constitution and has been continuously reaffirm, reaffirmed through statutes and U.S. Supreme Court decisions through the centuries. Today, this special trust relationship is often fulfilled by the federal agencies through tribal formula appropriations. So if differential privacy 
negatively impacts appropriations of a federally recognized tribe, can the tribe lodge a challenge? And if challenges are permitted, does the tribe have to pay for any resampling? Next slide, please. For the housing, um, demographic housing and characteristics file, data produced from the 2020 census will also help determine federal housing policies and appropriations for the next 10 years. This is especially important for low income and underserved communities. Applying differential privacy to the demographic and housing characteristics file could make housing needs appear better or worse than they in fact are. So how will differential privacy affect this data product is the question. Next slide, please. And I'll open it up now to committee discussion with Jason. Thank you. <laughs> your comments and questions. I'll try to answer a few of your questions. Um, you know, you, in the presentation, you may have noticed you know, the discussions now about data products are now also discussions about the disclosure avoidance methodology. And we talked about how we had, uh, were using basically three different approaches for these different sets of products. And one of the ideas behind that was to be able to still release as much detail as possible um, for each of those sort of categories of, of products and still protect privacy. And we found that by splitting those, those products up into those different categories allowed us to, to do that. And then for the, the detailed DHC, which would include some of the tables you mentioned or would be interested in, um, and some of the tables that are mentioned in the, the chat box, um, I think we're able to provide more accurate results for those tables using a different approach, using differential privacy than the approach that's being used for the um, DHC and the PL data. However, though, as I said earlier, we do have um, some additional subject matter experts on the line. So I was going to give Michael Halls an opportunity if he wanted to say anything or to address some of the comments about differential privacy. I believe he is still on. I know he was on earlier for um, um, James, James's presentation. So Michael, if you're on, and you'd like to say something, please please take the time at this point to do that. Well, he may not be on the call, but maybe he'll come on later. Um, and as I kind of described, the idea of using those three different approaches uh, uh, kind of allows us to use a different, different approach for each of the different types of products. And uh, the work on the detailed demographic and housing characteristics file or the detailed DHC, um, others have been involved with that. And also, we'll open it up in case there are any other subject matter experts who have been working more closely with that product. We'd like to say a few things about that work and that approach for disclosure avoidance. And if not, I think I can address the comments or the question in the, the chat box question about the um, complex person household join tables. And the question you ask is, are they going to provide, are we going to provide tables showing the number of children in single parents households? And I, I believe that's, that is planned in the DHCC. It is one of those complex person household join tables. The idea there are tables that um, kind of require maintaining the structure of the household for the tabulations. So for the DHC, um, the tables that we're producing as part of the DHD and are protecting using that disclosure and avoidance approach, they don't require to sort of maintain the, the members of the household for the tabulations. But there are some other tables that are more, other uh, variables or tables that are more complex and you need to sort of maintain that relationship. So for example, to have average household size by characteristics of the household, you need to maintain the household structure throughout that privacy protection mechanism to be able to produce those tabulations tabulations. So those types of tables have been moved to be included in the um, de de detailed DHC, and they'll be protected using a different approach. And I believe one of the, the main differences between the two approaches is that one produces a microdata file that supports the tabulations of the products for the PL product and the um, demographic and housing characteristics file or the DHC, whereas the uh, differential privacy work that's being done the disclosure avoidance work that's being done for the detailed DHC doesn't produce that underlying microdata, and that allows it to, to be more accurate but still provide the protections necessary. I 
And so, Jason, I don't know if you want to answer or just go through the, the four questions that Gina Adams had asked in the chat, and then we'll have a few other member questions. The third question was, um, can you tell us what tables related to children that we had from the 2010 census that will not be available for 2020? And again, by splitting these, these products up into these three categories, we really are striving to include as much in the way of as many of the tables that were provided in 2010 um, in 2020. I don't have in front of me or off the top of my head you know, a list of the tables that had uh, included information for children in household structure from 2010 and how they're uh, being produced for 2020, but that's one of the reasons why we have prepared the crosswalk file that's available online, and that lets you see all the tables that are planned uh, for the DHC in 2020 and how they relate to the tables in 2010. So I would encourage you to look at that table, which is available online through one of the links that I provided. And you know, if you, uh, one of the, the previous NAC presentations we provided on data products, we walked people through. Um, that crosswalk, so you can see exactly how to make sense out of it and what kind of some of the, uh, there's some, some uh, sort of code to, to how we refer to the tables and what levels of geography they're for. Um, and we can provide that if you're interested and we can provide that additional sort of guidance on how to use the, the crosswalk file. But in that file, it does provide the information uh, I think you're looking for in terms of what would be included in 20, was included in 2010, but will not be included or is not planned for inclusion. In, in 2020. Um, we still have to update that a little bit. As I mentioned in the presentation, we did make some, you know, we increased the number of race categories that were included in the tables that are iterated by race. Uh, so we do need to provide an updated crosswalk file that includes that and any other changes that we've made since the last time we made that file available. But we do plan to do that. And we also, as we work to finalize the tables that will be provided in the detailed DHC, we plan to do the same thing and provide a table that shows how those tables relate to um, the 2010 products and exactly what is going to be provided in those tables. Another thing that's provided in the crosswalk is not just a listing of the tables and how they relate to the 2010 product, but also you know, very detailed the layout of the tables, exactly what will be in those tables. And the fourth question. Fourth question is finally, please tell us about your ability to produce data that connects children and adults, essential for producing poverty data and important for the ACS. In past NACs, it appears that this issue had not been resolved. Has it been now and how? I believe some of the tables that would um, fit this purpose would be included in the detailed DHC, but I can't say for sure without knowing exactly what tables you're referencing. And if anybody else, again, uh, with more subject matter expertise in this area would like to add to that response, provide you the opportunity to do that. Okay, I can go on to the, the next question. Will the detailed DHC files include subgroups identified by race, including groups currently categorized by white race? Um, if you combine the DHC, what's available in the DHC with what's going to be released as part of the PL product, you have all of the, the OMB race categories uh, and all the combinations of categories, you do not have the detailed race responses. Though. Those will not be included in the DHC. Those detailed race responses, which, uh, as you may know, I think were collected for all of the races in uh, 2020, uh, that will be available as part of the detailed uh, DHC. And so our next question comes from Flo uh, Gutierrez. I think you had one in the chat, and you may also have a separate one. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. Um, thank you for, for that presentation. Um, I was wondering uh, what your plans were to include stakeholders in the discussion about the DHC um, files, and not just researchers, but um, in particular, we're interested about how you're going to be engaging civil rights groups and, and others. The DHC, the, the, the tables that are going to be included in the DHC, that part of, of the discussion and getting uh, external feedback um, sort of has already passed. That's, so we've already settled on more or less what's going to be included in the DHC, although we are open for input on that still. I think what you're 
more interested in is the work on, I mentioned the accuracy um, targets and the work on the privacy protection mechanism that will be used and the tuning of that um, system, just as we went through with the PL product. And we are currently in the process of developing that strategy. And as you saw, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking for input and we're trying to determine how much time we think is feasible, you know, balancing getting the data out to the public um, in a reasonable amount of time, but also providing time for uh, people to provide adequate input on uh, that system. And uh, we've mentioned before this idea of privacy and accuracy trade-offs, uh, that we get that balance uh, right and that the, the tuning of that system um, was done with public input. And again, we'll go through, and I mentioned that the cadence that it would follow a similar cadence to we follow as what we follow with the PL product in that we will develop these privacy protected microfiles as well as our own metrics. Um, and then with each sort of iterative stage in the development of that uh, disclosure avoidance system, we will release those products. And of course, the uh, privacy protected microfile allows external researchers to do their own tabulations, their own comparisons against the 2010 public, publicly available data. So they can see for themselves the variables and the data they're interested in and how those have changed after the protections have been applied. And then we also release um, metrics that we develop along with the PPMF that um, kind of provide pre-prepared accuracy measures. And we have worked extensively with different groups on the development of those metrics so that as soon as each iterative development stage is reached and a product is released, you can look at those metrics and you can see fairly quickly how we've been able to make improvements in protecting the data and maintaining accuracy. Um, and one of the things that we did, and I mentioned how we had split the, the, the work on the system that was going to protect the PL product as well as and the system that's going to protect the demographic and housing characteristics file and the demographic profiles, that initially that work was on, was taking place at the same time. So when we were doing that work initially, we did develop metrics that covered the full range of variables that would be available in the DHC. So although with the, the PPMFs and the metrics that have been released to support the PL product, we haven't been able to sort of fully fill out those tables and provide all the metrics that we've designed to allow the public to assess the methodology. When we do get into the work on the DHC, we will provide that, that full suite of metrics will be available because we'll have the full set of, of variables available for us to work with. So those are available now. There, as we release the uh, metrics, uh, accuracy metrics from the previous files uh, last week, uh, we included all the tables in the document that describes and, and explains, uh, provides background information on those metrics is also available. So you can look at that now and see all the metrics that will be available as we get into this work uh, on the disclosure avoidance system for the DHC. Thank you. Um, if you have a detailed plan for engagement, I think we would love to see that um, and provide feedback to see if it could be improved um, or, yeah, made better. I don't know if the Bureau has that, but we would love to see it, if it exists. We don't have it now, but we will. We are working on it, and when we do, we can, can share it. Thank you. And so this is um, Jim Tucker. I'm just going to, it's a process related question, just kind of following up on, on Flo's conversation. So I, I, as I understand it then from what you were saying, you, you expect that there will be a public notice and comment um, process that will be very, very similar to with what, what we've seen for the redistricting data. And I guess just as part of that, um, I, obviously we understand the privacy loss budget is going to be different. Um, do you also anticipate obviously the algorithm will be different as well? And then the final piece to it is, um, one of the things that's happened, and I think the Bureau's done an exceptionally good job on it in terms of the PPMFs released for, our, for the redistricting data, um, perhaps to get the timeline, um, and, and again, I'll put this as a recommendation, but it's just, um, it's also a question just, just to see if you've already considered this. Um, have you considered doing public and tribal consultations to specifically meet with stakeholders um, you know, tribal and non-tribal stakeholders regarding what their needs are for, to help you develop the timeline. I mean, obviously, as the NAC, we can do that as well, but I think that it's been something that's been very, very effective that you've done with the PL data, and I'm, I'm just wondering if there have been um, internal discussions about doing that as well for the DHC file. Yes, there have been discussions. I think I may, have, may leave that question to 
somebody else to answer on the plans for that engagement. Um, again, though, as 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 uh, just discussed, the idea is, is is to as we go through the work on that to uh, make the results available, let people see the results, let people see the impact, and then get feedback on those results. Um, that still represents uh, quite a bit of work and. There are still some unknowns, and that as we get and start working through that process, I think we will may have to make decisions on uh, what we can make available at certain levels of geography, and uh, what may need to be done to achieve levels of accuracy necessary, and at what you know if we may have to take steps where we don't think a particular table is fit for use based on uh, what we're seeing after it's protected. So there will be, you know, I think there will be work along those lines that will have to take place to get to. The sort of final result of what's going to be uh, at the end included in the DHC that we feel like we can release and, and that it does meet the fitness for use standards. And I think there will be a need to be a considerable amount of work on that as we go forward. And okay, I, I don't see any other questions on the queue. Um, and please, if you if you have questions, do that. I'm going to ask a follow up question. I'm just curious again because you've already you will have already gone through this entire process with the PL data. Um, are, to what extent, if any, are you planning on using the lessons learned both from the public portion of it but also just internally how you've worked with the, the PL data and apply that to what you expect to do with the DHC data? Uh, uh, thanks for that question. So we, as we've been working even on the, the PL and, and how we approach that, we've been incorporating all of the feedback and, and, and lessons learned throughout that process as we've worked through that process. So we've plan to continue to do that and, and hopefully have a, a, a refined process for the work on the DHC. Um, one of the things I mentioned towards the end of the presentation was how we were able to um, open up the review of the <coughs> preparing for release to the public a few weeks early to some external researchers who had the ability and the interest in Excuse me, Jason. This is Shana Banks. Please mute your line. Uh, like the, such a, if you're not presenting. Uh, so we were able to, to bring, have a few people obtain special sworn status and to work with them and to allow them to work and start to do analysis of the products, of the results for the PL product um, before we release to the public. And we would like to expand that and find some others to bring in that so that we can, you know, in a way it just kind of lets us, it's part of our quality assurance process for one to make sure that we don't because we're trying to do this very rapidly, and as we make a developmental improvement, we want to be able to release that to the public as quickly as possible to get feedback. We are using them in, a, in some ways to get uh, some additional QA before we release that product, but it also lets them start to do their analysis a little bit earlier, a little bit faster. And then we're also working with um, David Van Ripper at IPOMS, who, um, as we release this PPMF, this is a, a fairly large micro file, micro data file Fairly, fairly difficult to work with, so not a lot of people, some people find it difficult to access that and to work with that, but we've been able to work with him. Once we release it, he turns that data into a more usable format, and we plan to kind of continue that same approach as we go forward. Um, so those are some of the lessons learned we've already incorporated, and I'm sure we will be, as we go into this process, um, getting feedback from groups such as, as NAC and others to how we can have a, a better process as we work through the, the, uh, the work on the DHC. And again, I, I don't see any other people with hands raised. Um, again, just a related question to that, because I think the DHC data is a little bit different than what we're seeing with the PL data in the sense that we also have a number of federal and tribal agencies that specifically rely on that data. So I'm just curious the extent to which you're perhaps also planning on including stakeholders that are at other federal agencies um, to give their feedback, because Ultimately, they are the users, and they use a lot of this data for federal appropriations that are directed to state and local communities. I think we would like to uh, be able to obtain as much feedback and input on this process as, as we can. So I'm sure we'll be working to develop those strategies, and we'll have something that we can share as we go forward. Um, now to add that, you know, we're, we're very excited now to sort of be able to turn our attention back towards the data products. We've been very heavily involved in uh, the work on the apportionment product and the review of the census data files. And um, the last time we presented the NAC, I think, was in the fall of 2019 on data products. So we're excited to be able to pick this work back up and to really get into focusing on 
uh, work on the, the support to DHC and that product as we move forward. And then to close out the work on the, um, the PL, as I mentioned previously, we have released those PPMFs and uh, uh, detailed summary metrics for the um, PL uh, disclosure avoidance system, and we are looking to get feedback on that so we can that can be included in the final ESEP decision on the um, on the privacy protection system that will be used for that product. It looks like we have a question from Rosemary Rodriguez. Um, so please go ahead, and then um, that would be great. Thank you again from Denver, Colorado. Um, the state of Colorado's policy makers and our funders that we gathered for hard to count or hard to reach work included older adults in the population of those that we created special outreach to. It seems, especially since COVID, that their housing uh, concerns or issues probably uh, should be re really researched, and I just wondered if that type of research will be uh, reflected in the DDHC, um, especially concerns about group living quarters uh, related to some of the COVID experiences they had, and an emerging um, market for shared housing with younger, uh, younger adults, unrelated uh, situations. Thank you. I think you'll see there will be, and, and again, the, the crosswalk for the, the DHC is available. Some of those tables you may be interested in that, that provide some information on uh, household structure and household type will be available in the DHC. Um, you know, we did do some things in, in developing early on ways that we could include some of that information without having to maintain those, those uh, person household joins that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but as we work on the, the, the details of what will be included in the DHC, again, we will share that information, and uh, I think it will uh, provide the information. You know, we wanted you to provide as much as we can that was available in 2010, and I think we're probably going to get close to that. And I think the information you'd be looking for, you know, any, uh, I'm not sure if you're looking for information that's beyond the, what's available in the 2020 census, but the information available in the 2020 census, I think, will be available in um, in some format. And then, as I mentioned, there's that third category, which could include uh, special tabulation. So that, I think, um, although that third category that I mentioned that included a, a potentially a IPMS file and um, special tabulations, uh, we really haven't put much uh, work into that yet, but that will be, uh, as it's the third category, will be where we turn to. But that hopefully can any of the data needs that are not able to be met through um, the standard products, maybe they will be able to be addressed uh, through additional products. Thank you. And so we'll go back to Gina Adams, who has a question for Jason. Sorry, too many things to unmute. Uh, thank you so much for all your responses to this. And I, I, you may have said this, and I apologize if I missed it. When, when do you think the DDHC will be available? As I mentioned in the presentation, the timeline for all the products beyond the PL product is still being worked out. Um, it includes also products that aren't mentioned here, such as products for uh, the island areas as well. Um, I did mention, though, that the work on the uh, detailed DHC is, is occurring in parallel with the work on the DHC. So, Although I, I don't think we've released the detailed DHC before the um, DHC, I think you know it, the timing because work is going on in parallel. It may not follow the sort of the uh, pattern people might expect. Like there might be a big gap between the release of the DHC and the detailed DHC. But as I said, though, we're still working out the the timeline for that, and um, because we do want to provide. Uh, adequate time to get uh, feedback on the results from the disclosure avoidance system. Uh, we want to work that out really first before we can start committing to uh, the timeline for the release of both the DHC and the um, detailed DHC product. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. 
I don't see any other questions, um, but I, I, again, want to kind of conclude with a, a comment. Um, Jason, we really appreciate all the work that you're doing. I think what, you're, what, what you will get, um, I think it's fair to say consensus among NAC members is, you know, we applaud the, the efforts that you're trying to undergo to strike the right balance and thread the needle between accuracy and privacy. I think the thing that really strikes home so much for so many of the NAC members is that the DHC data is, you know, actually means dollars for, for lots of lots of very, um, um, you know, hard to count communities, but also communities that desperately need those, fund, th those funds and that even small variations in the count oftentimes can be the difference between a small community having a staff member who's permanently there um, assisting with housing and, and not having that person. So we, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation and um, we, we definitely, um, you know, look forward to um, working with you and trying to come up with a timeline that will be workable to achieve those goals. Thank you and thank you for your, your comments and, and questions. Okay, so thank you very much for that session. Um, so we're running a little bit early. Um, so James, were you thinking we would just take a 10 minute break perhaps and come back at about one o'clock or would you like to stretch the break a little bit or what would you like to do? I think based upon feedback from the NAC members, a longer break would actually be greatly appreciated. Okay. All right, well then why don't we uh, come back at 1.10 as we are scheduled and we'll pick up with the household poll survey overview at 1.10. All right, thank you. Welcome back from break. I'd now like to turn the conference back over to Karen Battle. You may now begin, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. All right, so moving on to our next presentation, uh, we will now hear from Jason Fields and Hyun Shin on the Experimental Household Poll Survey, uh, followed by discussant John Sandoval and committee discussion. So take it away, Hyun and Jason. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Household Pulse. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and John's going to uh, talk to you a lot about uh, some of the interesting results. So uh, do I advance, or does somebody else advance? Next slide. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the Household Pulse Survey, um, as probably lots of you know by now, is um, an experimental survey that was designed in rapid fashion from the period uh, mid-March uh, as, as things were shutting down with the coronavirus pandemic. And we uh, coordinated with five other agencies plus the Office of Management and Budget to get a uh, survey designed and up and running in about a month. So by April 23rd, we were collecting data. Census Bureau coordinated it. Um, the focus of the survey was to collect data on the way that household members' lives were being impacted by the pandemic. And since, uh, since things were changing so quickly, we really needed to be able to provide information back quickly as well. Um, it's, again, important to remember this is a proof of concept. Uh, it worked because we had access to a platform in the Qualtrics platform that was already FedRAMP moderate authorized. It was already uh, given an authority to operate in the Census Bureau's IT infrastructure. We had a programmers in-house in, um, in the research and methodology area that, that could program the instrument. And it importantly facilitated distribution modes that were not our standard distribution modes. So um, the National Processing Center was shut down due to COVID, so mail out uh, was not, not an option. Um, we also had no, uh, the phone centers were shut down, so we couldn't be using a phone survey. So we developed and, and quickly brought together two different 
sources of information to build a frame that included information about email addresses and cell phone numbers from um, administrative contact or administrative contact frame um, and connected that to the map. Uh, we'd like to, you know, this importantly, I think we, one of the things we also wanted to note on this slide is we originally thought that the household pulse was going to be about a 12 week operation. And here we are, we're about a year and a half later and we're still rolling. Um, we've accumulated additional partners, additional content. Um, so, and those are, those are listed here. Uh, next. Okay. So I, I mentioned the frame and, and that was an important component of the household pulse survey. The, 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 the contact frame data come from lots of different sources. They come from our respondents. Um, they come from vendors. It's important that the, the phone frame has over a billion phone and address pairs. Those are connected to the MAF and we uh, have a cell phone and an address uh, at least one for 79% of the ACS eligible addresses in the country. And those are relatively new. So about three quarters of those phone numbers were acquired in the past two years. Uh, the email frame similarly, 686 million um, email address pairs. Um, we kept up to five for each MAF ID of email addresses and five cell phone numbers for each MAF ID. Um, and the coverage for the email frame, again, on, uh, validated against the ACS eligible addresses uh, was about 74% of those. And those are also relatively new. And we they are updated um, multiple times a year and we've already had at least, uh, at least one or two updates uh, applied into the uh, household pulse frame data. Next, please. We're missing some. Uh, so, yeah, I don't want to hit next because I'm not sure. So that first slide is going to tell you, the first circle is going to show you that there are 144.8 uh, million household addresses in each of those light blue boxes. So, so that's kind of the universe that we're working with for the household pulse. Um, it, is slightly different than the uh, than the ACS eligible frame because it excludes um, all the GQs. We we were limiting to civilian non-institutionalized POP. Um, about 62% uh, of our of those MAF IDs had at least one um, cell phone number, and I believe the number that's not showing up was about 74% or so. Seven. It was in the mid 70s. Um, 75. 75, thanks, mm -hmm. um, had uh, at least one email address. And combined, the overall coverage was at about 81% of those 145 million MAF IDs. Next, please. Okay, so we had a lot of, we had uh, pretty good coverage, like I said, 81% of the MAF IDs. Um, we started data collection with a one-week interview cycle. Um, so we were interviewing beginning in April through the middle of July with a six-day cycle, day off, turn around, send out new sample. Um, there was a, a, a longitudinal component during that period of time, which is one of the reasons why the response rate is so exceptionally low. Um, basically, we took respondents to the first uh, first time they were included in sample and try and included them in a subsequent cycle. And then if they responded twice, they were included in a third cycle. Um, what we found out during this first phase of operations is that that was uh, doing a lot of damage to the ability to collect data. So we dropped that uh, longitudinal component and Households were only then after phase one included um, once, uh, sampled once for a cycle um, until that address came around again because it was a small state like, you know, D.C. or Rhode Island or something. Um, in phase two, three, two, three, uh, and then in phase, later in phase three, um, the sample, the response rate did bump up. 
So we extended the data collection to about 13 days. Um, we added additional contact attempts. Um, you will see that there is a, a dip down to about 5.3% um, during the week of the election. People were busy and otherwise occupied and didn't want to answer the household polls. But that said, we have sampled altogether almost 30 million sampled units, and we've collected about 2.4 million uh, interviewed households. Next, please. Our content has really focused on the priorities of our partner agencies. Um, census did not drive the, all of the content determination for this. Um, and you, you'll see that the focus is informed by, you know, kind of the basic areas of, um, uh, of uh, concern that those agencies might have. Um, and the ones that, you know, uh, particularly would impact um, the household in, during the pandemic. So employment. So we, we focused on uh, employment, losses of employment income, uh, telecommuting, um, and then in the most recent additions that started mid, uh, mid, um, mid April, uh, essential workers. And those data were, um, the data in green were just released this week in tabular form. Uh, food security included data uh, that the USDA requested about food sufficiency, SNAP receipt, uh, program use uh, and take up for unemployment insurance and social security programs. A, a pretty significant section on health insurance, uh, on health questions that included health insurance, mental health, which um, was fairly striking through the course of the pandemic. Um, we've recently added telehealth and children's preventive health care. Housing questions, these have been important. These will continue to be important as we watch, you know, what happens with uh, confidence in the ability to pay rent and mortgage and evictions and foreclosures. And, of course, education because, you know, the, the pandemic uh, impacted us in lots of different ways, but households with kids were particularly impacted as schools were also shut down. And next thing. Are we switching over? Oh, no, a couple more. Uh, so the questionnaire, uh, one of the things that's really uh, critical about our process was that we included um, expert review. We did web probing. We have um, what we call an affinity panel of people that volunteered to, um, to test questionnaires for us. So the question content was all tested uh, pretty rigorously before we included it in this self-administered uh, instrument. We feel that in, uh, the content in both English and Spanish, um, there are contact and uh, content scripts in, in both languages available. Next, please. Um, before each phase, we did cognitive testing. Um, we focused on, um, on the, the findings that would, maybe the barriers to understanding or use with the web survey, since this was solely collected over an internet instrument, um, that, that was part of the area that our cognitive testing focused on. Um, and then field experiments. So through this process, this was an experimental survey, um, and we were trying some stuff that was brand new. So we did some experimental uh, manipulations to help improve access to the Spanish translation, um, how to maybe improve uh, the bilingual materials, and importantly, how to you know, make sure that concepts like homeschooling was well understood, because just because your, your child is at home in school does not make them homeschooled. Um, so we had uh, some changes to the language in that respect. Next, please. And there was some ongoing open uh, response areas. So the folks in CBSM, our, our Center for uh, Behavioral and Survey Methods, um, took a look at lots of different pieces of input, including just some open-ended things. What should we be asking about? What, what are you concerned about? Um, and some of that has helped drive uh, a little bit of our, our understanding of, of what's in the pulse and, and what directions we should maybe push it in. And I think now it's over to Kian. 
Yeah. Yes. Next slide. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, for my part of the presentation, I wanted to show you some of the data that we have in the Household Pulse uh, by Hispanic origin and race. Um, as Jason described and showed you, we have a very large amount of content that has uh, shifted and changed over, over the last year. And I just wanted to highlight a few. So for this next section, I'm going to be showing data from the, the last six cycles of data, also known as weeks. We call them cycles. We interspersed that with calling them weeks um, of collection, which started in January 6th and went through March 29th. And I did that specifically because I wanted to highlight um, the, the estimates of those reporting receiving stimulus payments and the vaccine and the vaccination rates. And those didn't start until January. So in this slide, it shows the percentage who applied for unemployment insurance for these six cycles. And this is from our publicly available race and ethnicity groups. Um, they're Hispanic, white alone, not Hispanic, black alone, not Hispanic, Asian alone, not Hispanic, and the two or more, uh, plus all of the other race categories, not Hispanic. And I wanted to start with this slide because in the next several, what I did was in order to provide more detailed race and Hispanic origin groups, um, I had to pull multiple weeks of data. So these six cycles of data are pulled together to show some um, of more detailed race and ethnicity. So the other reason that I wanted to start with this is because this table shows what we provide um, by, the, by the six different weeks of data. But in order for me to pull all those together, um, it's averaging all of that information into, um, into one graphic or one estimate for each group, and in this instance, unemployment insurance um, application. Next slide. So on this slide, I'm showing the pool data for Hispanic origin groups. Puerto Ricans had the highest percentage who applied for UI during this period of January through March. Um, I also show the trend graph over on the bottom right, and, I'm, and I do this throughout just to help uh, remind folks that these percentages are averaging out all of the um, estimates. And some of these, uh, you know, unemployment insurance didn't really shift that much over the weeks, but some of the other topics that I'm going to go over did. And I think it's important to remember um, that the data that I'm showing for the detailed um, Hispanic origin groups in this slide is an average over those six cycles. Next slide. So this graphic shows then the detailed race as we collected them. These are the checkbox categories from the Pulse, and it is identical to the 2020 Census Questionnaire, the ACS, and our other current surveys. But because of the rapid nature of the collecting and disseminating of the Pulse, um, we do not have a coding operation that codes the write-in line for the American and Alaska Native, other Asian, other Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, and other some other race lines. So I just thought it would be important for you uh, to, you know, to know that as well. So by detailed race checkbox data, the percentage who applied for unemployment insurance ranged from about 14.1 to 32.9%. And I do want to mention that even with pooling these six cycles of data, many of these groups are not statistically different from one another. Um, if I pulled more weeks of data, data collected from last year, for instance, um, they will probably be able to make more conclusions about the differences among these groups. Uh, but for this presentation, many of these groups were just not statistically different um, from one another. Next slide. And as I mentioned before, part of that reason that I chose these six cycles was because I wanted to show at least some statistics in the, the um, who received the stimulus payment. Um, the stimulus question didn't start until week 22, uh, that cycle in January. We did have stimulus questions that we had from last year. We collected them in phase one of the questionnaire, but we didn't collect any in the latter part of last year. But with the new uh, stimulus payments that started at the end of December, we did start collecting stimulus again in the January cycle. Next slide. Again, the stimulus payments by Hispanic origin detailed groups, not a lot of variability among the groups, among the Hispanic origin groups. Next slide. Again, stimulus payments by race. There is some more variability, but as I mentioned before, that a lot of those groups um, are not statistically different from one another. 
next slide. So the next few slides that I'm going to show you is also um, shows you the mental health measures um, that we collect in the pulse from January through March. But this slide is important and it shows um, going back all the way from April of 2020 when we start collecting um, the, the mental health questions. And over the last year, we see that those reporting feeling anxious or worried, having lost interest or feeling down went up and down a bit. But the big takeaway from this graph is that the pulse respondents reported these feelings range, um, you know, from about 15% and upwards of 30%. And the, in comparison, the National Health Interview Survey um, that was conducted between January and June of 2019 showed that the anxiety symptoms were 8.2% and depressive symptoms were 6.6%. And these are the exact same questions and the methodology that we use for, um, for um, getting the anxiety and depressive symptoms. Next slide. And again, over the weeks um, of January through March, and looking at the percentage of reported symptoms of anxiety differed by race and Hispanic origin. Next slide. Symptoms of anxiety by Hispanic origin groups. Next slide. And again, by race. I do want to point out here that um, Samoan does appear to have the highest rate, but as I mentioned before, you know, Samoan being a very small um, race group, um, it is not statistically different from a lot of the other groups, um, and it just has larger margins of error just because of the population um, being as small it is, as it is. Next slide. Same thing with the depressive, uh, the symptoms of depression over the weeks. Next slide. Hispanic origin groups as well. Next slide. And symptoms of depression by race. Next slide. So the pulse also asks if um, asked if a doctor or other healthcare provider ever told them that they had COVID-19. Um, and as you can see here, Hispanics shown in the green line show the highest reporting and with the rest being significantly lower. Next slide. And then by detailed Hispanic origin, um, Mexicans did have the highest percentage reporting um, having had COVID from at 25.1%. Next slide. And among the race groups, there were varying degrees of having COVID-19 from about 4.5% to 19%. Next slide. Here then are the vaccination rates um, over those six cycles of collection, and not, not surprisingly, as vaccination rates among the Hispanic origin and race groups have gone up, um, as just vaccines in general have been more readily available to those um, as that time period passed. Next slide. Again, vaccination rates by Hispanic origin groups. And this, I think, is a clearer illustration of where I wanted to make sure that um, we showed the, the upward trend, but the, the slides by the detailed Hispanic origin and race groups are the average of those weeks. Next slide. And then by race groups, the vaccination rates range from 9.8% to about 39.3%. Um, and that is, you know, again, um, as vaccinations increased over that time period. Okay, next slide. So um, there are a variety of ways that you can get the household pulse data. These red ovals would have been a little bit more interactive, um, so you'll have to forgive me that they're just kind of sitting there on your slide deck. Um, but we have several different ways that we are disseminating these data out. Uh, we have data tables, we have public use files in SAS and in CSV. We also have an interactive tool, and we just recently released the vaccine tracker, which I'll go over in a little bit um, now, actually. Go ahead and next slide. Next slide. 
So this vaccine tracker, um, it actually shows then the vaccination rates um, by different characteristics um, for the states. And in the bottom left oval, if you see that, um, we actually have them by the different demographics. So we have it by age, um, by race, Hispanic origin, um, by education levels. And these, because these are from our publicly available race and um, ethnicity groups, they are not the detailed groups that I was able to provide to you in this presentation, but we do have these. And these would go back um, through starting the cycle 22, so the week 22 that started in January. We recently just released um, the latest data that started what we call phase 3.1. Uh, that just went out um, this past Wednesday as well. And in the middle, I also wanted to show that not only are we able to show the vaccination rates, but we also have uh, questions that show vaccine hesitancy. So can you go to the next slide? So this, if you, um, if you look on the left, it's a little easier to see on this slide. So on the left-hand side, you can see that we do have this vaccination tracker. In the dark blue, you see it's the vaccination rates, which is what I just showed in the previous slide. But in this vaccination hesitancy, um, we also show reasons for why respondents may say that they are hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, and you can look at this by the different demographics, age, sex, Hispanic origin, race, education levels, uh, insurance status, um, and the COVID-19 status. But you can also look at it geographically by how um, the hesitancy of the, vac the vaccinations uh, differ among the states as well. Next slide. We also have a variety of stories that the Census Bureau has put out over the last year. Um, they are available in our library stories. These go a little bit more in depth into the different content, um, the different changes that we've had over the phases. Um, and all of these stories are available through our library slash stories. Next slide. And uh, where to find the data? As I mentioned, there are multiple ways that you can get the data. We have our um, main page that has our, you know, that is sort of the landing page for the Household Pulse. We have our data tool um, that actually goes into more in depth than just the vaccine tracker. In the, in the interactive tool, we actually have unemployment insurance. We have um, those, we have different characteristics, education disruptions, um, and we've been putting this tool out that shows it by state, by the 15 largest metropolitan statistical areas, um, and over time as well. Um, that tool is a great way to just kind of get a really good snapshot of what's been happening um, throughout the year. As I mentioned, we have our vaccine tracker that we just released last month. And then we have our detailed tables, um, our technical documentation that has our source and accuracy statements, um, other background materials, and then for respondents, there is also the link for our uh, survey respondent overview page as well. Next slide. So our questions for NAC, um, so are there any special considerations for your constituency that we should keep in mind that might inhibit contact and participation in the Household Pulse Survey uh, via the email and text strategy? What are your concerns and recommendations regarding uh, different um, differential non-response by subgroups within the covered frame and for the map ID addresses? Um, that we don't, you know, we don't have either emails or cell phone numbers and therefore are currently excluded from the survey. And as we look forward to the future of the Pulse, as Jason mentioned, we originally had planned this to be um, 12 weeks of collection, um, but we see that it is not only continuing, but there is uh, much interest in the continuation of a rapid pulse survey, as the household pulse survey is. And so what questions or measures would we consider, especially as we think about the recovery? Next slide. And with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Hun. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Thanks, John. I'm John Sandoval. I'm joining you from California, and I'll be going through our discussion, comments, and questions. Next slide, please. 
So just as a matter of grounding, what exactly is a pulse? So our friends at Merriam-Webster have said, we can use the third definition here, which is underlying sentiment or opinion or an indication of it. And also in the blue highlight, vitality. Next slide, please. Just as a, a consumer, a, a, a human being in, in North America, the Pulse survey was really um, part of the overall consciousness and, and, and mindset over these past few months. This is a sampling of some new stories. I think um, just my own unprofessional anecdotal experience every day, there would be something that would come on either TV, radio, broadcast, print, digital, showing uh, how data from the Pulse was, was used and reported on. So obviously something that made a very big splash and was picked up in uh, lots of news outlets. And it really does reflect, if I remind everyone where we were, um, just level of uncertainty in terms of health, uh, economy, uh, and other areas. Next slide, please. Just some initial questions. We've already heard a little bit about the response rate um, and some hypotheses of the why the response rate was so low. And also when we take that into in consideration, how about people who are not responding? And is there a bias there? Is this something that we should be worried about? Is it insignificant or is it too early to tell? Um, by necessary means and, and requirements, you know, this survey was shared amongst, uh, you know, at the state level, national level, uh, large metropolitan areas, but are there areas or regions that have not been included that we should include going forward? And are there topics, questions that we can include in the survey importantly without affecting its efficacy? A survey can only be so long before it's cumbersome and just difficult to understand and, and loses its effectiveness. And, you know, is the census properly qualifying the information and data that the Pulse provides um, given the way it's distributed? and administered? And are these caveats clearly understood by consumers of the data? Next slide, please. I think it's important to recognize that as a proof of concept, I would submit that this has been a successful proof of concept. So we can see just demand of all the different federal agencies to participate in the survey. And given a, a populace and a community that is just so data hungry, especially amidst the environment of lots of uncertainty and, and lack of, of knowledge, um, this data was actual actionable. Not something that merely for information purposes, but this led to policy decisions, led to private sector decisions um, based on over the past few months. And for your consideration, um, given that we have established it and it's successful, what is the long-term role and purpose of the Household Pulse Survey? And is there funding required to continue it? Also for your consideration, perhaps Census Board should celebrate the success of the Household Pulse Service and get the necessary credit it deserves. Next slide, please. Of course, with anything, especially something that's experimental, there's room for improvement. So uh, would encourage learnings be applied to improve the study. And as mentioned during the presentation, the cadence has already been modified from weekly to almost bi-weekly. So uh, just really evaluating what, what, period, what is the right period um, to do. Next slide, please. Regarding the American count stories, I understand they reflect the internal interests of subject areas. For example, population, business and economy, and families. Overall, we know that media outlets are just plain lazy, and many newsrooms no longer have the headcount to actually conduct analysis on the raw data or puff files. So for your consideration, in order to ensure a fair representative rotation of topics for the American Sense stories to increase the odds that any news or the articles reflect the breadth of the data. It would also be interesting to understand what exactly was picked up and what is the lifetime of these stories once they leave the Census Bureau's distribution? Next slide, please. So now that it works, 
how else can it be used? To the extent we can have other uses, this will provide a valuable rationale for continuing the survey once hopefully the pandemic has subsided from our collective memories. One question I have is there a role for message testing an environment where customary qualification methods are unavailable? And really for your consideration, you know, can this household pulsar be used for other stuff, if you will, that require a timely and flexible reaction to input from the American public and subpopulations? Next slide, please. In conclusion, the household poll survey proved itself as a quick and efficient way to collect data during an unprecedented pandemic. It's not a perfect tool, and its caveats should be proactively communicated as it improved over time. The American Council Story has enjoyed a positive reception among media outlets at the national and regional level, and the HBF is a valuable methodology and tool that may be indicated for other topic and subject matter. This concludes my comments. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm happy to report that we have a very, very full queue of, um, it's, it's a fascinating survey. We're all very excited about it. And so we're gonna go in this order. We'll start off with Karthik, then Carol Hafford, then Guillaume, and then we will conclude with Teku. And um, I'll just add that there were some other questions that were asked in the chat. And once we get to Teku, if there's any additional time, we'll go back to the folks who asked questions just to make sure they were all answered. Thank you, Jim. Um, this is Karthik. So I put one in the chat, uh, and if uh, you know, folks can answer audio or on the chat with whether the unemployment findings generally corresponded with uh, unemployment insurance findings from the current population survey. That would be kind of one good way to um, check, uh, at least on some of these outcomes, uh, how the findings, especially by race, um, correspond to those that we can find from the current population survey. Um, the recommendation I have is with the public use microdata to be able to um, provide pooled data sets so that we can um, get that more detailed origin data for the Asian and Pacific Islander populations, as well as when I looked at the um, data dictionary, there are only 15 MSAs that, that are part of that, um, uh, you know, that are, that are part of that uh, microdata release. So ideally, with pooled data, um, we can we can get more metropolitan areas. Um, so not just to come up with uh, tabulated estimates, but to do some of the correlational analysis that's possible with uh, with the microdata. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. I'll start with that one, and then I'll um, I will defer to Jason about the unemployment insurance. But yes. So not only can you pool data together um, to get more detailed breaks, but you can also pool those weeks together. And as I said, I only did those six cycles, but you can go back all the way through um, the data that we collected um, back through April. The, the caveat being, because content changed, you do really have to pay close attention to the data dictionary to make sure that the questionnaire uh, of what you're trying to look for and, and pool together are actually available for all of those weeks. Um, but yes, you can also do that in order to get a little bit more robustness in the, in the data um, for geographies, those 15 metropolitan statistical areas, as well as some of the smaller states as well. Just to follow up though, I didn't see in the data dictionary the codes for the more detailed origin or geography. Oh yes, right. Um, so in, in our publicly available data, unfortunately, it is just those major groups that I showed in the trend line. So the Hispanic, white not Hispanic, white alone not Hispanic, um, black alone not Hispanic, Asian alone not Hispanic, and then all of the other race groups plus two or more in our PUF. Um, you, if you are or any data user is a part of a, um, an RDC, um, and have special source status, you can actually have access to the more detailed um, checkboxes. And that is in our, um, in our IRE yeah. um, platform. Yeah. And, and to, add, to add to that a little bit, um, you know, we, we are kind of limited in the data that we could put out on the PUF. Um, just from the disclosure point of view, that's why race is collapsed. Um, our, 
one characteristic of the household pulse data is that it is very, very minimally edited and, and, and processed. Um, we only edit and impute the basic demographics so that we can apply weighting. Um, other than that, it has missing data, inconsistent data. It's all, re all reported data. So that was another reason why the Disclosure Review Board is particularly sensitive to making sure that, you know, the, the data are appropriately protected. Um, in the IRE, you would have access to uh, the detailed race, Hispanic origin. Um, you would have access to more detailed geography. Uh, we've had the, the USDA researchers who are our partners with the food sufficiency content um, working through the IRE uh, to generate Essentially, they, they, they've done some county-level linking and to apply county-level rural-urban uh, recodes to the data, which is not something that we provide on the public use data, but it is something that you can do through the, um, through the, uh, through the IRE and the, the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. Just like anybody else, the USDA has to go through the Disclosure Review Board to you know, release any of those data, um, and they have they have been doing so and releasing data aggregated up to the national level. So at the national level, what is the relationship between food sufficiency and urban urban rural status, for example? Um, the other part to, of the question was about unemployment. So. The Household Pulse does not measure unemployment the same way the current population survey does. It was never intended to do so. This current population survey has a fairly long series of questions that also asks about your intentions for finding a job and, and looking for work, um, which is a critical part of measuring unemployment versus being out of the labor force. Um, in the Household Pulse, we were really focusing on, with BLS's input, um, the, the economic impact to the household. So that's why the work questions, the employment loss questions are focused on have you or anyone in the household um, lost employment income? Not necessarily just lost your job, but lost employment income. Um, and the work status is about currently working or working in the last seven days. The reasons for not working do include a couple items that are important that you can use to kind of narrow in on COVID-related job loss um, because you can exclude people who say they're not working because they're retired. You can exclude people who are saying they're not working because they didn't want to work. It's not the same series of questions as the CPS, so I would be really cautious about trying to make the household pulse estimates of unemployment match the current population survey. So I, that answers your question. I, I see that we're actually two minutes over. So what I'm going to ask is, uh, by the way, that just shows you it's such a fascinating topic. I'm going to ask the NAC members who are in the queue to please make note of your questions. Carol, you had some very detailed questions. If you can make note of those and we'll include them in requests for information that we'll send to you separately. Uh, because we don't want to cut short our last presentation on community resilience estimates. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, we're all really excited about the Household Hall survey, uh, as I think you probably saw with the interest level on in the questions. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. And so now we will move on, um, as James said, to our final presenter of the day. We have here who will present on the Community Resilience Estimates, followed by discussants Cherokee Bradley, Enter Deep Chat Wrap, and Committee Discussion. Great, thank you. And yeah, I'm very excited um, to be here today to talk about this other experimental data product um, the Census Bureau has put together as a um, result of COVID-19 and a desire to provide the public with the data it needs to um, help make data-driven decisions. Um, as, I, as was said, I'm Chase Sawyer. Um, I recently um, joined the CRE team or the Community Resilience Estimates team um, in the last few months as the team lead, but I've been um, working for the pro on the project um, since the beginning of last summer now, um, providing insight 
on um, the use of ACS variables and um, that how we can use that data to create this um, this set of estimates. So next slide here. So today, um, I think it's very important to kind of set the stage and why um, the Census Bureau is looking at resilience and then also what resilience is. Um, we'll talk about the current iteration of the community resilience estimates and what we've published and what we're looking to do um, in the near term. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit more about um, what we're hoping to do in the future and where we're looking to go. So on the next slide, we'll see the definition of resilience that we use. And so, again, it's, I think, important to kind of pin this down since there are um, differing ideas about what vulnerability and risk and resilience are. Um, the definition that we use is that community resilience is a measure of the capacity of individuals and households within a community to cope with the external stresses of the impact of a disaster. And um, the research that's out there shows that resilience can be predicted by individual and household characteristics. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about Oh, if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. So yes, here on the next slide, we're going to talk about why the Census Bureau, um, it has a great insight in how we can measure resilience. Um, other measures, such as um, the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index or um, the SVI, they use publicly available data from the decennial census or the American Community Survey to create these risk indices. And because they're using that publicly available data, they can lack um, some of the granularity or the accuracy that we do within the Census Bureau when we're looking at the restricted microdata. And so by using the restricted ACS microdata as part of our tabulation process and then modeling, we're able to retain the correlation of individual risks. And so this allows us to um, publish a usable estimation of error, um, do statistical testing, as well as it makes it more ideal for ensuring the equitable distribution of resources since we're able to uh, retain that correlation. And because that data is not available to the public readily, unless um, you're able to do that through an RDC, the Census Bureau being able to do it um, is extremely beneficial to the public. Next slide. The, the Census Bureau is also very capable at doing this. Um, we have the capability to do so, and I think that um, since we do, we're going to be able to provide the public with what it needs in the subject. We are the nation's leading provider of quality data. Um, and it makes us well positioned to provide that accurate and timely measure. We're also able um, to adapt with the methodology that we have, that we're able to incorporate um, additional data, whether or not we're able to link individually, we can join um, other publicly available data as part of our modeling, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and also, the Census Bureau has a track record of inviting collaboration and um, working with federal stakeholders. So again, the, all these things make the Census Bureau ideal for creating a measure of resilience. So on the next slide, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the need for the CRE. And I think the need for data to um, help measure re resilience and help with um, disaster planning has always existed. It's just never existed on such a wide scale that we haven't had a national pandemic like this um, in the computer age. And so COVID-19 has really reiterated that need to have the timely, accurate, and customizable information for the public. And we've had many groups reach out to the Census Bureau for data, um, but I think what we quickly find is that what they're really looking for doesn't always line up with um, the subjects and the definitions that we have. And so the CRE um, will hopefully help bridge that gap and give people some of the exact information that they need. Um, and the 
the need for the CRE, the goal really is to create meaningful information from the vast quantities of Census Bureau data that is available. Next slide. So yeah, this at this point, I really wanna get into explaining some of the nuts and the bolts of what the CRE or the Community Resilience Estimates are. And so these are modeled estimates of social vulnerability of the population. And so we use um, data from the American Community Survey. Um, this is a nationally representative um, population survey that goes out to 3.5 million households each year and has more than 40 different topic areas. And so we are actually able to use the um, internal microdata as we're doing this tabulation and then putting it into our model. We also use the population estimates. Um, these are used um, as part of the weighting and the distribution of people within the model. Um, we use information by tract, age group, race, ethnicity, and sex. And um, by using this, it helps to smooth out some of those ACS estimates that can um, vary um, due to survey error. And finally, as part of this, um, we use the publicly available 2018 National Health Interview Survey, or NHIS. And so this is one of the principal um, sources of information on health for the non-institutionalized population. And so this cross-sectional survey um, of about 35,000 households or 87,000 individuals is something that we use the publicly available information they had. Um, as part of our estimates and to assign that to our um, ACS survey respondents. And so all of these inputs are then modeled using um, the methodology that we have from the small area um, income and poverty estimates program, as well as the small area health insurance estimates program. Um, and that has a track record of almost 30 years now of being used for um, modeling and providing yearly data for some of these small areas. And so we use that as the framework um, to run this model with the CRE. So next slide. So here I'll go over a few of the individual risk flags um, that we assign from the American Community Survey as well as the National Health Interview Survey. And so as we're creating these um, custom tabulations that are then used as the input for our modeling from the ACS, we're looking at things such as um, people that are age 65 and older. I'm not gonna go through each one, um, but just a few such as um, single or zero caregiver homes, people that are in crowded homes, um, as well as people that have disabilities or so, all some of the things that we look at as we're um, looking at the ACS data and then creating these flag tabulations. Um, and then we've also using that publicly available NHIS data have assigned um, systematically um, respiratory disease, heart disease, and diabetes um, by age, sex, Hispanic origin, race, as well as um, census region. And so the, that gets assigned to individuals and is then used as part of the tabulation. Next slide. So the output of all that ends up being the community resilience estimates. And so we publish our estimates um, for the state, county, and track level. Um, and I think the track level is especially great because these are um, based on one year ACS data. And at least to the best of my knowledge, I don't know that we have any estimates other than the Centennial Census that has track level data available. So um, the CRE makes that information available and we um, publish the estimates of the number of individuals um, based on the number of risk factors that they have. And so um, we publish these groups of zero flagged risk factors, one to two flagged risk factors, and three or more risk factors. And the three or more risk factors is um, what we consider to be the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. Um, and as an output nation nationwide, we see that um, 20, about 26% of the population has three or more risk factors. The next slide. So the um, first iteration of the CRE was released last year in June um, using 2018 ACS data as the base. Um, in May of this year, we're actually, well, in this month, 
we're planning to release an iteration with um, the 2019 ACS data um, with some alterations to it. Um, for example, we decided not to include the health factors um, in this iteration after speaking with stakeholders at HHS and CDC. Um, they're very interested in the product, but didn't want the data to be correlated with what they would point it out with things like heart disease and um, respiratory disease. So <clears throat> that is one of the changes in our um, recent iteration, as well as we're looking to add um, risk factors for not having internet access within the home, as well as um, no vehicles available within the household. So next slide. And so I wanted to also go ahead and provide um, some information about how we're making this data available to the public. So um, the first is that we'll go over the Community Resilience Estimates Dashboard. Um, we'll just look at the comma separated file very quickly, as well as talk about um, some successes that we've had as people have reached out to our staff directly. So on the next slide, we go ahead and we're able to see the dashboard um, that we created in, um, by working with Esri. And so on the dashboard, you're able to get a national view of um, risk for any of the risk factor categories actually. So you can see the percentage of the population that has each of those factors. And you're also able to um, kind of subset this data and some of the comparisons in the bar charts, as well as the um, pie charts below by the filters on the top and changing by um, the risk factors that are available. Also with the screenshot, you're not able to see it, but as you zoom in, and you get closer to some of the counties, you're then able to get some of the track level data and you can click on each of those areas um, to get those estimates. And we also have additional information here about if you wanted to look at the predominant risk in an area, that almost always ends up being one to two risk factors. Um, but the ones that do pop out, I think are very interesting. Um, and then you can also get the COVID impact report here. So next slide. And then I do just like pointing out as well that we do have um, the CSV file available. We publish that with a um, with a file layout as well as a quick guide. Um, I just pointed out because yeah, we do these presentations sometimes, and people think the only way to access the data is through the tool. Um, but no, it's definitely available for individuals to go through and um, run through their own data infrastructure. Next slide. And then I would like to just take a couple of minutes to talk about um, some of the successes we've had with people um, reaching out to our staff. Um, and so we've worked with some of the FEMA regions and they're using the CRE in conjunction with other data to look at deploying um, mobile vaccination units in some of their areas, especially in the um, New England area. Um, Maryland Emergency Management Agency actually reached out to us a few weeks ago and their only hang up was that they needed it in a shape file. And so we got them that and now they're running and using that for mobile vaccination units as well. Um, this again has happened with Austin Public Health. And then also one of the success stories I'm most excited about is working with um, the CDC SBI team or the Social Vulnerability Index team. Um, it's always very interesting to go to someone and talk about um, some of the areas that they could improve their product. Um, but as we've talked with them and we've shown them what we have, we see that we can look to help build upon each other's work. Next slide. And here, I just, again, wanted to talk about um, some of the benefits of using the CRE. Um, we've had um, great response to it. And I think the public is very interested in getting a measure like this. Um, it's very timely in the fact that we are using the one year ACS um, data collection as our input. So it is available as it follows that ACS flow. Um, it's the most statistically accurate because we're reducing air through a small area modeling, as well as we're able to provide that air um, when other individuals are kind of putting ACS variables on top of each other to um, create estimates. They're not able to incorporate that. 
And we're also able to provide um, the most granular measure of vulnerability. And again, the, the small area methodologies have been proven and they've been used um, for many years now. Next slide. And um, where we're looking to go from here is we're trying to get involved with um, various other stakeholders. Um, as I've mentioned, we've talked with CDC, um, but we've also talked with Health and Human Services, um, as well as the Economic Development Agency, and they're all interested in um, some of the different iterations of the CRE we could create for them. Um, we're also interested in making some of these different iterations on our own. Um, we know from the research and the literature that the risk factors for hurricanes and wildfires, as well as COVID-19, are all different um, from each other. And so while we're fo very focused on COVID-19 as this part of this model, um, we're interested in seeing what we can do to help in some of these other areas. And we're also very interested in um, the research that we can do in this space. Um, most of the academic knowledge at this time is based on risk factors that are based on publicly available information. And we think that it'd be very interesting to look at kind of tweaking some of those, like maybe eight, raising the age limit that we're using is one that comes up a lot. And so um, those kind of things and how we might weight the risks are all things that we're interested in um, researching more. So next question, or next slide. And so, yeah, these are the questions um, that we had for the group that we wanted to put out there. Um, the first being, are there key items you think should be included in future iterations of the CRE? Two, are there other focus areas that you feel the CRE should be developed for? And three, are there other areas or groups that you would recommend we reach out to for, about, for education about or collaboration on the CRE? So next slide. Again, yeah, I just, I'm gr very grateful for this opportunity um, to present to you and to meet and talk about how we might um, look at improving the CRE. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions. And the next few, I have a few slides in there that are kind of appendix slides um, that we maybe want to move through so we can get to the discussant portion. I think we have probably two or three more slides that are there for context if we want to talk about the measures. But I think we're two away from the discussion slide. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So I believe I'm on. Thank you. And good afternoon from a cold, foggy day in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, my name is Indadeep, and thank you, Tate, for your presentation. And thank you so much for sharing your presentation with Cherokee and I earlier this week. That was extremely helpful in our understanding. And of course, your revisions have clarified some of the questions that we noted in our discussion. And I appreciate that. And so as a result of that, we may just skip a couple of our discussion slides. So as noted in today's presentation, the CRE is a measure of individual and household's capacity to endure and recover from impacts of disaster. So this new experimental data project obviously is very timely and it's made available through an easy to use tool which shows risk levels by state, county, and track. Um, as he pointed out, this tool provides local officials, public health agencies, policymakers, and community stakeholders to estimate resiliency. And um, the ultimate, ultimate goal, of course, being to implement mitigation strategies. Uh, while the current experimental CREs were developed in response to the current pandemic, the benefits are far-reaching and applicable to other forms of disasters. And, and beyond, you know, social and public health sustainability of communities and perhaps allocation of resources. Um, we commend Census Bureau efforts in creating a tool to help measure the degree of community resilience in the face of disasters. And of course, applaud your effort to be transparent and willingness to reach out to scholars, academic communities, and other experts to continue to improve the CRE to use for the larger public good. So Cherokee, Cherokee, if you have any comments, please go ahead. But if not, we will just share a few slides for a discussion. And we encourage, uh, 
committee members to please ask questions and to add to the recommendations list that we've already started. So uh, thank you, Jason. Next slide, please. Jadiki, did you have any comments? No, with the number of questions that's coming through through the queue, I think we need to go ahead and move through the slides. Okay, thank you. So we can actually skip this slide because this is where uh, was in uh, Jason's original slide, uh, Chase's original slide, and we clarified that. So we can actually skip that slide. So these are some of the questions. Uh, social vulnerability index is prominently uh, presented in the first uh, version of the presentation, and therefore we had several questions, but I have noted that uh, Jay does not put that in the appendix. It's definitely a very useful uh, set of data in um, index developed uh, by this uh, scholar in South Carolina, I believe. So we uh, as a committee have several, we as a group, Jerry and myself, have some questions in terms of clarification, um, but the main question really was, if there are so many limitations to this um, social vulnerability index, why did uh, the CRE team decide to sort of use that as one of their sort of the primary uh, points of departure in developing CRE? So I think you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to tackle a couple of discussion item slides and then Cherokee will take over after this slide, I believe. So the first item is that, as you know, that the National uh, Institute of Health Sciences, they factor age, sex, ethnicity, and regions in all of their data, and that's how they cut their data and develop the cross tabs and the tabulations. Um, but we weren't sure when we first talked about this whether any of these uh, factors were available for the other data sources that are used in developing CRC. So that's one question, and I think I also see that question in the chat. Uh, the next item we wanted uh, to put to Chase was moving forward. Would it be possible to gauge recovery, as noted in the quick guide, which, by the way, is a very well put together, uh, very clear, and uh, useful public document? So if so, please provide some information. Three, has CREs been used in actual or hypothetical scenarios to validate or examine their utility in developing guidelines for distribution of resources, distribution of resources, sorry, both tangible and non-tangible resources? So in other words, have the CRE, CRE estimates been tested to ensure equal distribution? And I guess that would be the next step uh, once you get past the first part of the, of the discussion item. Um, the fourth is, prior to CREs for COVID-19 initiatives, has the Bureau used other measures or index to allocate resources for impacted areas? Next slide, please. Jackie, you're on. So in regards to the discussion items, how will the CRE assessment be linked to the Bureau's priority or action? Um, we're interested in seeing how these this data would develop in concrete activities that not only relate to government-related activities from a global framework, but to that of a more systemic and meso level. Um, regarding additional iterations, will the Bureau identify, assess, and monitor risk, and will this call for a new tool in assessing a CRE? Um, again, addressing outcomes from a more of a global perspective that can be drilled out. Next slide, please. So, in regards to updates, um, to, to some degree discussing framework, are there any enhancements planned for the 2021 release? And is there a timeline for, of limitations noted in your presentation? Um, we have this also coming in on a recommendation, somewhat in a recommendation, is there a time frame for the public and community agencies to access this data? And then in regards to stakeholders, um, stakeholder engagement is an important and essential element in developing CIE, CRE, excuse me, and that strongly recommends setting up a, maybe a work group or subcommittee as you are in development. Next slide, please. So we do have some recommendations that we will discuss, but we also are going to present on our final recommendations and we'll just glaze over those here. Um, and then later open up for the opportunity to chase for you to maybe address some of the questions that we presented in the previous slide and then open and further move along into committee discussions because, again, I see we have some questions in the queue. So 
What are our first recommendations that at an appropriate time would it be useful to seek stakeholder engagement, perhaps setting up a next subcommittee, as you just um, mentioned previously, with an initial step to develop the process for this purpose? The second, if possible, develop a time frame for the public and community agencies to access relevant data and information. And as research develops and Census Bureau acquires additional data and experience with working with CREs, consider additional factors and the measures which predict resilience. And I think that's, that's in the queue. That question is in the queue a couple of times. It would be extremely helpful to examine CRE's utility in developing guidelines for distribution or resource for both tangible and non-tangible resources. Next slide, please. And this were questions and comments, and Ch thank you, Chase, and your team. And I wanted to allow for the opportunity for you to maybe respond to some of the questions that we've had previously. Yeah, no, I think that'd be great if we could go um, back just a couple slides um, so I can keep them <laughs> fresh. But <laughs> tell us when it's time. Uh, so go back two more. You're starting with um, question, what's number two? Is there one more slide to go back to, or is this? Is there, I think there is. Go back once, once more to introduce the slide. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, yeah, great. So, no, this, so this first question about um, slicing the data is a great one. I think, yeah, what did come up in the chat as well um, about publication of data, and so, Right now, it is only the total pop in each of those groups that the CRE is published for. Um, as we start to splice it, it gets a little more difficult um, with retaining the additive function of the data and making sure that the results um, add up and make sense. And so that's something we're definitely looking into more, um, especially with the risk factors, because people do want to know as well, with this age, sex, ethnicity, and regions is important. And then they're also like, okay, well, we want to know how many people didn't have internet access or didn't have this or were 65 plus. And so right now, the best answer we've had with the risk factors is the data is akin to the ACS data. So we've tried pairing it there and just kind of looking at that as, as explaining the story. Um, but I think in the future, our real goal is to be able to produce some sort of synthesized microdata set that could then be used um, for people to look into these things further. But yeah, we're we're still getting there. Um, but I think yeah, this this idea of looking at an age, sex, ethnicity, and region is something that we actually hadn't had on our radar. We were mostly looking at the risk factors. So I appreciate um, this discussion item. Um, going to number two about it being able to gauge recovery. And so, yeah, we're actually in conversations now um, to discuss about how um, CRE could be used um, by the Economic Development Agency as part of the recovery efforts. And so I think there we're gonna be able to work together to better gauge um, recovery. I think right now um, we're still trying to work that through, but we definitely think that this tool provides people the ability to see what areas are going to have these um, socioeconomic traits that put them at risk. Um, and I think this actually goes to the third question as well um, about looking at if there are um, scenarios that we can go ahead and prove the model against for the distribution of funds, but, but I think also just to prove that it exists. And so, and we have brought in a few researchers to go ahead and look at um, excess death from the Numenden and compare that with the first iteration of the CRE. Um, we're very interested in that because a lot of the COVID-19 statistics that have been compiled together um, all have different quarks when you look at them um, across the nation. So we're, we do want to look at excess death, and that's something we're interested in. Um, then at the same time, though, I do like pointing out the fact that SAPE and SAHE um, have been used for funding um, distribution for a number of years now. And so while the CRE hasn't, doesn't have that yet, it is built on this framework um, that has done that in the past. And then here to four about looking at measures as well as an index 
to allocate resources for impacted areas. I have to say, I'm not sure of a time that we've created this measure. Um, the CDC's SBI is really the largest um, program, I think, in this space using the ACS data. The Census Bureau does provide information um, based on disaster regions, though, as part of the um, on the map emergency management tool. And while I am not well versed in that, I do know that we have that available to the public. And so I think next slide, I can look at those discussion items as well. How will the CRE assessment or tool be linked um, to the Census Bureau's priority of action? Um, so this may be above my play grade, pay grade, but I'm very hopeful that we'll continue to grow out the CRE. Um, I, I will say at my time in the Bureau, I haven't seen a project be, people be so excited about it and developing it. So I am hopeful that we'll um, continue to grow this out. And as we are developing those stakeholder relationships and people are um, very interested in it. So I think we're gonna keep growing it out. Um, and regarding additional iterations, um, will the Census Bureau identify, assess, and monitor risks? Um, will this cause a new tool um, in assessing CRE? And so I think um, this is definitely something that we're going um, to look into as well. Um, we're very interested in how the risk factors interact as well as the different disasters that may cause that. Um, for example, with hurricanes, from what we've read in some of the research, just having a concrete house is such a big change in whether or not your home is going to be damaged or not. And that's something we could look at using administrative records um, to bring in information about that um, as well. So I think, yeah, we're definitely um, working to always be a reassessing this as we look at different iterations. I guess just before we move forward, are there any kind of follow-ups, questions to any of the answers that I provided? I don't have any. Do you have any, Andrew? No, I just wanted to make a comment that, and thank Jim actually to assigning this topic uh, for me to learn more about, because this is so important. You know, of course, we talk about a lot of data, a lot of statistics, sort of legacy files, all of those, those things that make it all happen, but this really directs is really directly related to people, household, and communities. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. You know, that whole bureaucracy is, is about improving the lives of people and communities. And this directly provides information, uh, you know, to, to impact that. And especially when they are most vulnerable, that is during the disaster or a pandemic or so forth. So yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to learn more about this. Thanks, Jason. I think we can move to um, the comments in the queue, if you're, if you're okay with that, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, I'm looking great. at the time, and we've got about eight minutes, and we have a hard stop just because we have to complete our recommendations. So what I'm going to ask, we have three people in the queue. I'm going to ask you to keep your questions as concise as possible so we can get through all three and still conclude on time. We did, it's a great topic, and we appreciate it, Robert. Um, so we're going to go in this order. It'll be Charles Bruner. Then Ioma, um, and then followed by Rosemary. Well, well, thank you. This is Charles Bruner, and I really am grateful that you're reaching out and doing this. I really urge you to look at datadiversitykids.org, the Child Vulnerability Index developed by, by us, actually, and uh, used through the NNIP, and some of the other iterations that have been done by different groups like the Kinder Institute around these uh, factors. Um, and uh, I've also looked at the, the CBI. Um, I would really also look to look at certain variables that you can gather, which are very important for the census, not as risk set factors per se, but to look at them in relation to the risk factors. So the population over 65, the population under 18, the population under five, the, the racial composition, the immigration status, and the um, household primary language status, all not being risk factors in themselves, but clearly um, we want to know if there are neighborhoods and, and, and communities where there are high levels of risk factors, how do they relate 
to those categories. So I, and um, the second thing is, I mean, I do think that there is a wealth of information that are on risk factors that you can go back to the definitions of social determinants of health and well-being or whatever, and they do relate to, they do relate to wealth, income, employment, housing, uh, the availability of amenities like internet and automobiles, um, the realized educational capital of the people in the community, the social structure of families. And I think that it's really important to try to uh, pull those out as factors and be fulsome and present them in addition to the index so people can see mm -hmm. that. And I would say when you do that, I think that there are two things that come out that are very important to highlight. And they're my recommendations for the committee. One being that when you look at these high risk or uh, low resilience communities, they are very rich in young children. They are disproportionately populated mm -hmm. by young children and young families so that um, when we're looking at doing something about it, one has to look at those with the context of what do kids need in their home neighborhood environment going forward. They're also hugely racially segregated. There's, you know, I mean, if you look at the Child Vulnerability Index in the, the top 10%, uh, I mean, I just took Texas and did Texas, 90% of the people living in those neighborhoods are of color compared with 35% overall. They are hugely racially segregated marginalized. So I think we find that as one thing. The second thing, and I noticed that with your, your map, if you look at a county level and you start to compare, there is rural counties are more likely to show up as having higher rates of social vulnerability lack of resiliency, persistent poverty or whatever. If you look at the census tract level, the variations within counties are much more profound than those mm -hmm. that exist across counties. And I mean, Congress is talking about persistently poor counties and um, we have to focus more attention on persistently poor counties. And that, that may work for the Department of Agriculture. But if you look at that, LA County, Wayne County, DC are not part of, are not persistently poor counties. And yet they have populations, persistently poor regions that are many more magnitudes the size and often the disparity in outcomes as others. So I really would urge you to look at, um, the difference between looking at this index at a county level and looking at it at a tract level, um, because actually those most disinvested, vulnerable, underserved, discriminated against marginalized communities are located within metropolitan areas or they're located in the, the Southwest or in the Deep South as far often as, as tribal communities. But they by and large are not what shows up on a map of persistently poor um, counties. So I really have kind of the answers. I really encourage you to, to take that focus and to work to make available not just the index, but the information behind the index that that does get at those different factors. Definitely, yeah. Happy Thank to you. Share stuff with you and uh, and and do whatever I can to connect you up to, to uh, who I think uh, have been doing this uh, some of the best cutting edge research in the area. And I think the social vulnerability index by CDC is good enough, but it really misses a whole lot of dimensions and it particularly misses those around uh, children and young families. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, for those those comments and things to think through. Yeah, I think that definitely is 
going to help us think about how we want to look at the data um, going forward. So again, thank you. Yeah, and Charles, I'm going to ask you just because you asked uh, uh, quite a bit, if you could pro perhaps put that in a request that we could forward on to Robert, that would be great. I'm sensitive mm -hmm. to the time. We have just two minutes left. I'm actually hoping we can get both questions in. So if you could please be really, really concise, um, Ioma, and then we can get so that we can get Rosemary in as well. I will do my best, and I and I already have my written down, so I'll and I'll send it to chat. But I really um, want to highlight if there is a way to not have the sort of CRE be so negatively released, right? The way it really reads right now is really about risk and risk mm -hmm. factors. And so I do wonder if there's ways to really capture more of the promoted protective pieces. And so, for example, looking at things like access to resources, family, community support, mm -hmm. economic, racial, ethnic integration. Um, so there's other things to look at. So I wonder if there's ways to kind of really, um, I think, pull that up, especially because people do use the CRE and, C and the SBI in particular to really capture sort of like, especially racism, for example, and sort of systemic inequity. So there's ways to really sort of show both and as opposed to just one narrow slice of the risk. Mm -hmm. I think that could be even more useful for the um, for, for users. So thank you for your work. Yeah, definitely. No, and yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, I know myself personally, yeah, I, it would be nice to dig into those more. We haven't had a chance yet, but to hear that we should um, is heartening to me. So thank you. Okay, with that, we're going to allow you to jump in, Rosemary, and then you will give the final question before we go to our break in our uh, individual discussion um, discussions. Thank you, uh, Rosemary Colorado, associating myself with both of the previous comments, but uh, 47 states are distributing opioid uh, settlement funds, and I just thought that might be one of the uh, one of the additions. And I thank you for the opportunity to learn about this. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I saw that in the chat and thought that was um, a great idea as well. And no, I, yeah, it's definitely something we need to do more about as a nation. So thank you. And so as we, um, before I turn it over to Karen, I just want to thank you, Robert, for a great presentation, mm -hmm. Interdeep and Cherokee, also um, awesome. It obviously spurred a lot of discussion. I just want to make one comment to the NAC members. Um, when we go into break, if you could just stay on the phone line for just a moment, I just want to discuss with you real quick what will happen in the breakout rooms. Thanks, Karen. It's yours. All right. Thank you. So, yes, it is time for a 10-minute break. Um, and after the break, the NAC members will congregate uh, to discuss and formulate their recommendations. Um, so we will reconvene at 4.30 p.m. today for the presentation of the 2021 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting Recommendation. So thank you very much. Welcome back from break. I'd like to turn the conference over to Karen Battle. You may now begin, Ms. Battle. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, welcome back to the 2021 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting. And now James Tucker will present the 2021 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting recommendations. Thanks so much, Karen. I'm just waiting the controls and then I will share my screen. Okay, I can now do that. Bear with me for one moment. And everyone should be able to just confirm that you can actually see the recommendations now. Okay. Not hearing any dissent. Um, yes, Jay, so the way, Okay, great. The way, we, the way we're going to do this is um, I'm just going to read only the recommendations, not any explanatory information, and then the NAC as a whole will be voting on these in groups of five, just so that we can get through all of them. I will just mention that we've got over 70 recommendations, and I think this is actually an instance where it's both quantity and quality. Um, and so I'm getting a little bit of feedback as well, uh, so please mute if you are not speaking. Um, so number one. The NAC recommends that the terms of all active NAC members serving as of October 2nd, 2020 be extended for a period of one year to account for the year in which the NAC was inoperative as a federal advisory committee in violation of its charter. Recommendation number two, 
The NAC recommends that its fall 2021 meeting be held on November 4th through 5th, 2021. Recommendation number three. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau charter a NAC working group to provide feedback from the 2020 Census and recommendations to improve future survey operations and planning for the 2030 Census for hard to count, limited English proficient, racial and ethnic populations. The working group should be chartered through 2022, provide deliverables at future NAC meetings and produce a final written report and recommendations. Recommendation number four. From 2016 to 2020, the NAC chartered an undercount of young children working group. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau renew the charter and extend it to apply to all of the demographic surveys. This group will provide recommendations to improve data quality or data collection for children across demographic surveys, such as the decennial census, ACS, and CPS, et cetera. And then the final one for our first group is number five. The NAC recommends the creation of a new NAC subcommittee to address the politicization of the census. Um, it should actually be the Census Bureau. Let me add that in. Or no, I, I'm sorry, that, that's actually correct. Politicization of the census and increasing public engagement to focus on the importance of accurate data. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up and all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. All those opposed say nay. Okay. Not hearing any dissent, recommendations one through five are adopted. So for the next five, number six. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish an administrative records and imputation working group. Recommendation number seven. The NAC recommends that the fall 2021 NAC meeting include a presentation and discussion of the OMB decision on race categories, future plans on race categories for the 2030 census, as well as the implications of reporting on 63 plus race categories. Number eight, the NAC recommends that at the fall 2021 NAC meeting that the Census Bureau provide the NAC with an update on 2020 census data quality indicators, including the PES, for the undercount of young children, children of color, communities of color, and low-income families, as well as the potential overcount of non-Hispanic white families and higher-income families. Recommendation number nine, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau include in the fall 2021 NAC meeting agenda a discussion on the enumeration of sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI, in census surveys, including the 2030 census, ACS, and other periodic and annual surveys. And then the final recommendation in our next group, number 10, the NAC recommends that at a future NAC meeting, the Bureau present the work being done to modernize and transform its operations and, and explain in what ways the NAC and other stakeholders can inform the Bureau's future data collection strategy. strategy. So with that, everyone, please open your line. And uh, all those in favor of numbers six through 10, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Okay, not hearing any dissent, uh, recommendations six through 10 are adopted. Uh, please meet your lines. And then going on to number 11, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau coordinate with OMB to commence a new notice and comment period on the race and ethnicity standards for the purpose of modernizing those standards to more accurately reflect race and ethnicity, indigenous peoples, sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI. Comments submitted during previous federal register notices on the OMB race and ethnicity standards also should be considered. Number 12, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau work with the OMB to authorize the inclusion of AMENA, Middle Eastern, North African category as an ethnicity in the 2030 census. Number 13, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve the instruction on mixed race or of multiple races to better inform respondents how they may answer the race question on census surveys and test that instruction with partners and organizations working with communities of color. Recommendation 14, 
The NAC recommends that future research on race and ethnicity include examining the replacement of the term, quote, Hispanic, close quote, in favor of the word, quote, Latino, close quote. Census research should indicate or should include ethnographic analysis, focus groups, and survey methodological assessments. Alternatively, the terms Hispanic should be added up to the term Latinos. And then the final one in our next group, 15. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau conduct field tests to resolve methods of communicating with and surveying households with non-traditional mailing addresses for the decennial census and all other periodic and annual surveys. And with that, please open your lines. And all of those in favor, please uh, signal by saying aye. Hey, Jim. Aye. 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 Yes, um, someone had a Jim, question. Sorry, yeah, just, and I just noticed this as a point of information. I believe it's point 11 on Nina. I don't know if we mean to only say ethnicity because I thought it was a race category, not an ethnicity category. Okay, I'm going back. Um, I think it's number 12. Okay. And so I'm going to defer to Helen. Um, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? So number 12. Um, actually, no. Um, our our um, I think our community would like it to be t tested and included as an ethnic category. Okay, any further discussion on number 12? Um, Karthik, does that answer your question? Okay, I mean, I just, I, I, for me, I guess the, it's just a point of information because, because I thought at the last public comment period that it was, it was alongside the other racial categories and it was not a separate ethnicity question. So it's just a point of information. I mean, I, I guess ultimately it's the Census Bureau that decides what it is based on what the, what that guidance was. So it was just a point of information in terms of what that recommendation was last time around. Okay, and I'm just going to open it up to Dan, Dan, Dan Lichter, I, I think this is a, it's a, it's a white ethnic group. I think it's not a racial category, I don't think. I think it's a, an ethnic category, the way that it had been discussed previously. Would, would it be appropriate then if I just, perhaps, and Helen, I defer to you, if I just delete the words as an ethnicity so it just reads, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau work with the OMB to authorize the inclusion of a MENA, MENA category in the 2030 Census. Um, actually, Jim, um, I think that um, our research has shown that it, the, the, it's important to, um, to test it and include it as an ethnicity because there's a lot of dis disagreement about, uh, about racializing it. So I, it, um, I would prefer that it remain um, entered as an ethnicity. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is just um, find out, is there any further discussion of this? Because I would like to go back and just have a, um, a vote on just number 12 as written as Helen has proposed it. Uh, Jim, can I jump in? I, I think for me, the cons I think this is a issue that previous NACs have discussed at length, and I think there's some sensitivity around this issue. I would personally feel more comfortable discussing this in person than <laughs> at a phone call at the end of a two-day meeting. And it also um, potentially could create some tension with our, <clears throat> our other recommendation that the Census Bureau go back to and revisit the proposed changes to the race and ethnicity question uh, uh, specifically to combine the previous uh, Hispanicity Latin, Latinidad question with the race question. So um, I think without the deliberation, I feel like I need to abstain on, on this uh, on this question. And, and so could you just identify who spoke just because they need it? Oh, sorry, this is Teku. Sorry, this is Teku. Lee. Oh, okay. Thank you, Teku. Uh, so what we will do is we'll, we'll go ahead and have a vote on it. And if um, you know, the, the other option, of course, is that we hold this over, but um, at this point, I think there's probably enough um, folks who are willing to vote on this now, but we'll at least do that. So all of those in favor of adopting recommendation number 12 as written, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau work with the OMB to authorize the inclusion of a MENA category as an ethnicity in the 2030 Census. Please unmute and in indicate, so indicate by saying aye. 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 aye.
All opposed, say nay. And then any abstentions? Aye. So, aye. 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 Okay. So number 12 is adopted as written. And I understand we may have further conversations about this, but um, it is adopted as written. So number 16. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau streamline the timeline from when applicants are recruited, hired, and onboarded to provide more regular communications with applicants about the status of their application and operational requirements using methods of communication other than broadband and email where necessary. And I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I think some folks may need to mute their lines. Uh, number 17, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau change its instructions for identification of quote, person one, close quote, to be culturally appropriate for all population groups without unduly emphasizing economic or gender status that many groups do not consider to be an appropriate means of identifying the head of household. Recommendation 18, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish a pilot program which includes technical assistance for the ACS, allowing tribal officials to serve as Title 13 enumerators for surveys on reservations in tribal areas including off-reservation trust lands. If successful, the pilot program should be expanded to the 2030 census. Recommendation 19, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau begin all of its update, enumerate, and update leave field operations at least six weeks before the self-response open period opens for the 2030 census. And recommendation 20, sorry about that. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve its media buys for its decennial, annual, and periodic surveys that are directed at sheltered, homeless, and transient populations through increased ads, more likely to reach those communities such as billboards and bus boards. So at this time, please unmute and all of those in favor of recommendations. <clears throat> 20, please so indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say nay and any abstentions. Uh, please mute and we go down to the next five. Um, recommendation 21, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau improve its asset mapping of local media outlets, especially those serving hard to count populations. Recommendation 22, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau timely communicate information about changes to its field operations in plain English that has been tested with impacted communities in a manner that best promotes self-responses. Recommendation 23, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's contingency planning for the 2030 Census and other annual and periodic surveys determine how households with non-traditional mailing addresses or those households lacking broadband or telephone access will be contacted and surveyed if no in-person activities can be conducted. Recommendation 24, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau include in the end-to-end -end test the dress rehearsal for the decennial um, simulations of highly disruptive contingencies such as a pandemic, civil unrest, acts of nature, or a terrorist incident to minimize the recurrence of what happened in the 2020 Census when many untested operational changes were made in response to the global pandemic. And then recommendation 25, the NAC recommends Census Bureau improve its contingency planning by partnering with other federal agencies that respond to emergencies, such as FEMA, private entities like the Red Cross, and organizations re representing hard to count populations and communities of color in the development of those plans. So please unmute and all of those in favor of numbers 20 through 25 or 21 through 25, please so indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And any abstentions? Not hearing any, please mute your lines. We'll do the next five. Recommendation 26, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau use messaging and recruitment methods for its decennial, periodic, and annual surveys that are more culturally appropriate for communities of color. Recommendation 27, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve and expand upon its Tribal Partnership Specialist Program by making it an evergreen program that establishes a pool of permanent full-time partnership specialists for the AIAN population and other hard-to-count populations. 
the Partnership Specialist Program should be available for all census surveys, including the ACS and other periodic and annual surveys. Number 28, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau appoint a senior staffer to coordinate and oversee efforts to more accurately count young children for all demographic surveys, administrative records, population estimates, and other data activities. Recommendation 29, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau supplement its 2020 Census Data Quality Review with records obtained from tribal governments, national organizations, and other partners to evaluate the accuracy of population counts from communities of color with high levels of housing instability. And then recommendation 30, the NAC recommends that the Bureau assess and report to the NAC the quality of the 2020 census in terms of the undercount for subgroups, including children as well as racial and ethnic groups, subgroups that are often undercounted. These should include a breakdown at the state and substate levels and work to assess the undercount of a broader range of racial and ethnic groups beyond Black and Latinx. Note, this recommendation is relevant for other groups interested in the undercount of racial and ethnic groups. So please unmute and indicate that you adopt um, recommendations 26 through 30 by indicating aye. 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 Any opposed to recommendations 26 through 30? And any abstentions? Okay, 26 through 30 are adopted. Uh, recommendation 31. The NAC recommends that the Bureau conduct a thorough evaluation of the efforts to count young children in the 2020 census to assess what worked and didn't. Efforts should include evaluation of the effectiveness of the Every Door Direct Mailer, the communications campaign, coverage improvement efforts, and whether administrative records is an effective method to count young children in households that did not self-respond and that were not captured through non-response follow-up. Recommendation 32. The NAC recommends that the Bureau include in any evaluations or testing of demographic products, such as the ACS methods test panel, and in any planning for the 2030 census, A, a survey of parents to assess how well families understand whether they should count their young children, B, testing of which new language terms, including infants, newborns, toddlers, and preschoolers, work best to ensure that respondents count their young children, and C, testing different strategies for rostering questions given that nearly 20% of respondents do not realize they should, should report their young children. Recommendation 33, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau use the lessons learned from their young children evaluations to support more accurate data collection on children and particularly children of color for all of their demographic products. Recommendation 34, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau conduct evaluations for hard-to-count communities, such as young children and other historically undercounted populations, with the assistance of community organizations as appropriate. Recommendation 35. The NAC recommends that the Bureau establish operational measures that go beyond household response rates. Operational success measure, measures should capture the completeness of the household response, including the actual numbers of individuals living in the household. And so please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendations 31 through 35 by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. And then any abstentions to recommendations 31 through 35. Not hearing any, 31 through 35 are adopted. Recommendation 36. The NAC recommends that the Bureau identify those communities that need particular attention when it comes to explaining data accuracy and data quality, including post-processing operations, as part of proactive outreach to the public and data users designed to restore trust in the Census data products and the Bureau. Recommendation 37, the NAC recommends that the Bureau improve transparency and data aggregation relating to characteristic imputation, including frequency and sources, and conduct public demonstrations and outreach to specific communities to explain imputation and its effect on data accuracy and quality. Recommendation 38, the NAC recommends that the Bureau provide transparent data about non-responses and a comparison of non-responses between 2020 and previous censuses, including information on how data varies across racial and ethnic groups and subgroups. 
Recommendation 39, the NAC recommends that the Bureau assess and report 2020 census data relating to overcounts for subgroups, including by racial and ethnic groups that are often overcounted. These should, be, these should um, break down at the state and political subdivision levels and work to assess the overcount of a broader range of racial and ethnic groups. Recommendation 40, the NAC recommends that the Bureau provide transparent and proactive communications to the public regarding post-processing, including iterative uh, nature of census operations as a way of building that trust with the census and the rigor that goes into the data products. So at this time, please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendations 36 through 40 by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed to 36 through 40? Say nay. And any abstentions to 36 through 40? You're not hearing any. Recommendations 36 through 40 are adopted. Uh, the next five, recommendation 41. The NAC recommends that the Bureau should, to the greatest extent possible, release to the public data and findings on 2020 census, um, census quality and 2020 characteristic imputation disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and identifying specific effects on young children. Recommendation 42, the NAC recommends that the Bureau evaluate the use of administrative records to enumerate households for the purposes identified above, which are stated in the narrative above. Recommendation 43, the NAC recommends the Bureau only use administrative records to supplement in italics, self-response and non-response follow-up. Administrative records should not be used to replace these strategies. Recommendation 44, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau examine proxy interview quality to determine how accurate it is, the race and ethnicity of the proxy respondent, and whether there are an indicia of quality issues with the information provided by the proxy respondent to include whether the respondent may have had an incentive to report false information. And the last of these, uh, recommendation 45, the NAC recommends that the Bureau consult with the um, Census Scientific Advisory Committee outside experts or National Academy of Sciences to find effective ways to address the correlation bias in the PES as it relates to young children and households of color. So at this time, please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendations 41 through 45 by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed to 41 through 45, please say nay. And any abstentions to 41 through 45? Okay, recommendations 41 through 45 are adopted. Recommendation 46. Hi, Jane Tucker. This is Shauna Banks. May I interrupt you just a moment? Yes, please. We have currently reached the five, nearing 5 p.m. Is your goal to continue through the recommendations, or do you want to table until our next public meeting? We, we would prefer to get through them. We have about 30 to go, so we, we're, we're about 60% of the way through. And if possible, I think we can get through the remainder. It'll be about 20 to 25 minutes, no more than 25 minutes to complete. You may continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, so recommendation 46. Uh, actually, I should read that the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau release a public use file containing all data collected from the post enumeration survey in order to allow replication of estimates of undercounts and overcounts. And I'm just gonna add in those words. Okay, recommendation 47. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau identify which geographic areas have the greatest percentage of low quality responses, in parentheses, responses other than self-response or interview with a household respondent, close parents, and work with community partners in those areas to identify other sources of high quality data that can be used to supplement data from the PES, such as tribal enrollment records, immigration and naturalization assistance records, et cetera, to obtain a more accurate quality assessment. Recommendation 48, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau conduct a recall bias study of responses to the 2020 Census as it did in the 2010 Census. Recommendation 49, the NAC recommends the Census include update leave households in the post enumeration survey to determine how well the Census Bureau counted these populations in the 2020 Census. Recommendation 50, 
The NAC recommends that the census broaden its engagement and do a better job of communicating post-enumeration survey results to historically undercounted populations, including utilizing census information centers to engage populations, national partners from the 2020 census, and consult with the NAC on additional opportunities to broaden its outreach on PES results with these populations. And at this time, please unmute um, to, and indicate your assent to recommendations 46 through 50 by saying aye. 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 Any opposed to recommendations 46 through 50, please say nay. And any abstentions to recommendations 46 through 50. Okay, recommendations 46 through 50 are adopted. And please mute your lines. Uh, recommendation 51. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish an internal technical working group to study the root causes of the differential undercount and develop methodological, technical, and operational strategies to reduce or eliminate the differential undercount of race and ethnic populations in the 2030 census. Recommendation 52. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau explore opportunities to include an internal technical working group to study the root causes of the differential undercount, as explained above, in the 2030 research agenda to include ethnographic research and survey research. Recommendation 53. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau more clearly communicate to the public the nature of the data that will be included in the quote-unquote legacy release scheduled for mid-August 2021. Recommendation 54, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau provide an online video to walk data users through the, uh, quote, legacy data release, how to access it, and the online technical guides and tools to format it. Recommendation 55, the NAC recommends that in preparation for Census 2030 and any anticipated changes in the format of new files, and in the event of any disruption or delay to the publication of the PL 94171 redistricting file, the Census Bureau be prepared to have a legacy format file ready for use at least 60 days prior to the publication of the PL 94171 redistricting file. And with that, please unmute your lines and indicate your assent to recommendations 51 through 55 by saying aye. 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 And any opposed to 51 through 55, please say nay. And any abstentions? Recommendations 51 through 55 are adopted. Please meet your lines. Um, recommendation 56, the NAC recommends that for the 2030 census, the Census Bureau consider the implications of providing alternative formats of race permutation tabulated data for the 2030 PL 94171 redistricting file and report back to the NAC. Recommendation 57, the NAC recommends that the Bureau engage in scenario planning and communicate those plans to the NAC and the public about the Bureau's capacity to adjust disclosure avoidance procedures if ordered to do so by a court. Recommendation 58, the NAC recommends a working group be formed on sexual orientation and gender identity, or, or SOGI, for ACS purposes to discuss best practices for survey measurement for the LGBTQ populations. Recommendation 59, the NAC recommends that the Bureau continue to provide data at the block level in all 2020 census products. These data are of high quality or high utility for research and other uses. Uh, we are not gonna be covering number 60 now. We will hold that. So um, please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendations 56 through 59 by indicating aye. 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 And any any opposed to 56 through 59, please say so by saying nay. And any abstentions? So recommendations 56 through 59 are adopted. Recommendation 60 is held over. Recommendation 61. The NAC recommends that the Bureau ask in the uh, HPS or household poll survey, how many children are in each household? How many children are under five? how many are five to 12, and how many are 13 to 17 years old. Recommendation 62, the NAC recommends that the Bureau include questions in the HPS that, access, uh, that, that assess um, the mental health of children. And let me change that, I think it should be assess. 
Um, recommendation 63, the NAC recommends that in the question on page 30 of the HPS, which says, quote, which if any of the following occurred in the last four weeks as a result of childcare being closed or unavailable, close quote, be amended to say, quote, as a result of childcare being closed, unavailable, unaffordable, or because you are concerned about your child's safety in care, close quote. Recommendation 64, the NAC recommends adding a question to the HPS regarding the factors affecting parents' access to care, allowing parents to check off as many as applied to their situation, including the new reasons listed in recommendation 63. This question should go between the two existing child care questions. And we are going to hold recommendation 65. So please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendation 61 through 64 by saying aye. 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 All opposed to 61 through 64, so indicate by saying nay. And any abstentions? Recommendations 61 through 64 are adopted. We will hold over recommendation 65. Recommendation 66. The NAC recommends adding a battery of questions to the HBS regarding preventative health care okay, for others, similar to the questions posed for children. Um, and please mute if you're if you're not speaking. Recommendation 67, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau continue to fund and request appropriate budget support, including any necessary increase or improvements for the HPS in order to, one, support an always on, always on base level to maintain the platform and infrastructure required to further develop the tool, and two, build a budget reserve for increased operation in response to episodic events like natural disasters, pandemics, and wildfires. Recommendation 68, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau explore categories for subgroup breakdown for black slash African Americans, such as Haitian, U.S. Virgin Islands, Jamaican, Nigerian, other Africa, et cetera. We are able to do this for other minority racial groups, so we should be able to do this for the black group. We would like to see the same, the same detail presented in the HPS and other products. Recommendation 69, the NAC recommends a thorough and detailed non-response bias study. The non-response bias study should include both unit non-response with respect to sampling, bias and item non-response with respect to specific questions where there might be cultural barriers for responding to sensitive items like COVID positivity, mental health outcomes, benefit seeking behavior. And then we are holding over recommendation 70. So. Uh, please unmute and indicate your assent to recommendations 66 through 69 by saying aye. 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 And any dissent, please indicate by saying nay. And any abstentions. Recommendations 66 through 69 are adopted. Recommendation 70 is held over. Recommendation 71. The NAC recommends a close look at the relationship between language of interview, under coverage, and non-response bias in the HPS. Recommendation 72, the NAC recommends that dimensions of social, demographic, and living conditions be incorporated and reported into ACS factors slash flags to gauge disparate impact on individuals and households. This should include detailed information such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, and regions. Recommendation 73, the NAC recommends that a time frame for the public and community uh, agencies be established to access these data, develop a time frame and a process for the public and community agencies to access relevant data and information. And then our last recommendation of the day is recommendation 74. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau increase its stakeholder engagement on the CREs to include setting up a NAC subcommittee and working with other state interested stakeholders to de develop and refine CREs. So please indicate your adoption um, on mute. Indicate your adoption of recommendation 71 through 74 by stating aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions. 
Okay, not hearing any recommendations, 71 through 74 are adopted. The, the balance of the recommendations will be held over um, until the next NAC meeting, which will be um, on, on May 27th. So with that, I want to, before I turn it back over um, to Karen, I just want to thank the NAC members for extraordinary work over the last two days. Um, the fact that we were able to come up with so many um, uh, recommendations, but also following such engaging discussion and the presentations, um, we, we especially appreciate that. Uh, the discussants did a great job, and we also applaud um, all of the census uh, SMEs and all the folks on the advisory committee branch for all the work on, on to make this happen. And Jim, you're going to send our, all the ones that have been laid over to the 27th so that we can look at them again, because I, I thought there were a couple there that we were going to speak to, but we didn't. Yes, yes, Charles, I, I will send those. And just so folks know, we have a total of roughly about 15 to 20 recommendations that will be held over, but again, not held over for long. They'll be held over for 20 days until we meet again on the 27th. And with that, help, um, Karen, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, this concludes the 2021 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting proceeding for day two. Thanks to each committee member and participant for such an engaging, interesting meeting. Uh, your comments and perspectives are vital to our efforts. Uh, but before adjourning, I'd like to thank you all for your participation. And I also want to thank the members of the advisory committee branch for their work in organizing this meeting and all the supporting census offices that made this meeting successful. Uh, please note, as James mentioned, that next, uh, next meeting is a special session on differential privacy scheduled for May 27, 2021. So this concludes the NAC 2021 Spring Virtual Proceedings. The meeting is now adjourned. That concludes today's conference. All participants may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by for your post-conference. Thank you.